Okay, as the participant numbers are ticking up, I'm going to kick things off. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, whatever time zone you're in. I'm Amy Keating, I'm president of the Protein Society. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar on diversifying protein science. And while we wait for people to log in, I'm just going to introduce the society and make a few announcements. Uh, the Protein Society is an international organization. We have members from 30 countries. We publish the journal Protein Science and in a normal year, which 2020 is certainly not, we run an annual symposium focused on protein science. This, I have to advance, this past summer we planned to run the World Conference on Protein Science in Sapporo, Japan in collaboration with the Protein Science Society of Japan and the Asia Pacific Protein Association. That meeting was canceled, of course, due to COVID and we've been exploring ways to deliver content and to sustain our community online. We've been doing this with webinars and our webinar series has been a great success. Um, we've had three science-focused webinars so far with outstanding speakers and content. If you missed these, some of the talks were recorded and can be accessed from our website. Two exciting webinars that are coming up have been organized by our members. These are liquid liquid phase separation of proteins and their role in pathology, which is organized by Fabrizio Chitti, and new capabilities in computational protein design organized by Chris Ball. And you should save the date and you can register for these online at the protein society website. I also want to mention it's not too late to send in your own proposal to organize and host a webinar. Um, we will organize it and zoom it across the world as we're doing today and you can find instructions about how to put that together and apply if you um, look at our website or follow the link in the chat. Oops. Um, so next July marks the return of our annual symposium. We will be offering outstanding scientific content and career development opportunities and networking for young scientists. You can watch our website for the list of ter terrific speakers that Jeannie Hardy, the program chair, has put together and also watch that space for information about how to register. A highlight of the July meeting will be the presentation of the 2021 Protein Society Awards. We give seven awards, as shown here, in different categories, and all of the awardees come um, from nominations made by our members. Today's panelists, Jane Clark and Mike Summers, are both former Protein Society awardees. And in keeping with the theme of today's webinar, we strongly encourage you to nominate outstanding scientists from groups that are underrepresented in protein scientists in protein science. And you can do that by submitting your nomination by December 1st, coming up quickly. Okay, so that brings me to today's webinar. At the Protein Society, we aim to present webinars that are timely and relevant. And in the view of the Protein Society Executive Council, we feel that few topics could be as timely or as relevant as promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community and in our field. In the wake of a summer that was filled with reminders of the many racial disparities in the US, we feel that 2020 is an important call to action for us all. At the Protein Society, we believe that Black Lives Matter and that individuals from all backgrounds should be able to live their lives and contribute to science free from discrimination, harassment, and bias. And we've been thinking of things we can do in the society to make a difference. So the Protein Society Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee leads the way for us. This committee was founded by past Protein Society President Charlie Brooks, and it's now chaired by Professor Bill Clemens. This group is working to provide events and opportunities to our members, starting with the workshop that we're all attending here today. So I'm super grateful to the DEI committee for their time and their ideas and their efforts, and I'm really looking forward to the program that they've put together for us. So with that, I will hand things over to Bill Clements. Okay. Thanks, Amy. And 
I'm not sure what screen I'm sharing now. Turn it again. Okay, is that okay, Amy? That looks great. Good. Okay. Um, Great, thank you, Amy. Um, it's my real pleasure to uh, to get a chance to to lead off here in our discussion. Um, my goal is to be brief because uh, I think we've got a really great set of panelists um, to talk today. And so I just want to give a little bit of perspective, um, sort of from the Protein Society, but also um, amplifying some of what Amy's already said about why we're here today. Um, so today, um, just to give you some structures, after I finish the the, the the following four speakers will each speak for 15 minutes. Um, they will give their presentation, but the questions will be reserved for the Q&A section. So we're gonna have a discussion section after everybody's spoken. Um, please submit your uh, questions to the Q&A, to the Q&A option on the bottom of your screen. That's going to be um, uh, uh, moderated by our um, uh, uh, DEI committee uh, members, and then they will select questions from that, and then we'll have a 45 minute discussion based on pre-submitted pre questions and questions that come up for the Q&A. Uh, our goal is to provide um, a lot of material, some of what you get today, but also the, the recording from the seminar will be available online. And so the, the DI committee is interested in really expanding um, on, this, uh, on this moment. Um, this is the first perhaps of, of I think, of something that we will, do, we will do regularly, but the goal um, is to actually you know, make usable material for everyone. So just be on the lookout for, for that as it comes online. All right, so um, so just as you know, from a personal perspective, I'm I've been um, active in the protein society for a while now. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite uh, uh, groups uh, to be associated with. I think largely the protein society has really represented um, goals for diversity, but I think it's it's um, important to reflect on sort of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. And so, um, you know, as um, Amy noted, we're in a uh, 2020 is a crazy year in every sense of the word. This has been the, the most remarkable year of my lifetime, which I don't think is so long. Uh, and it's hard for me to reflect on any time prior to this for myself personally, where I've had these sorts of experiences. And I'll say as a person who is identified as black in this country, um, you know, much of the history that we have uh, associated with, with racial injustices and systematic disparities um, in our society are things that, uh, that I've spent my whole life reflecting on. So this isn't necessarily new um, in terms of my experience, but it definitely is a new moment in terms of, of sort of national awakening in the U.S. And, uh, and I do want to emphasize, I think, these issues and, and, and you know, both our committee and our, um, and, uh, and our speaker list are, you know, it's an international group because I think these are international problems. And while we're largely focusing today, uh, you know, at least in this introduction on, on the U.S., I think this is really reflective of problems that go back um, centuries and that these are things that are really rooted in the way that our, our societies are structured. And so, um, and so that really motivates, you know, why we're 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 moved to have this kind of discussion. Uh, you know, some of the things that we've witnessed over the years, but especially um, uh, you know, amplified this year, have really changed the way that we uh, we have perspective on on the America that we know, the United States of America that we know, and the way that we interact with uh, with our various groups. And you know, if you could allow me to, to just um, you know, shift going back in time, right? So this is where we are now. How did we get here? And there's an interesting number that I think maybe some people, um, uh, more people, I think, are aware of today. This is a number that that uh, that is uh, uh, is sort of seared in my own memory conceptually. And that number is 1619. 1619 is the year that the first slaves, the first slaves, were sold um, off the coast of Virginia by Portuguese sailors who had been in a who had captured slaves from colonial wars um, on the west coast of Africa and sailed them up the coast of, uh, of the Americas. And in Virginia sold, um, the numbers aren't known exactly, but 20 to 30 um, uh, uh, Africans were sold into slavery to an English colony. And that those 20 to 30 um, people uh, were sold into slavery, into chattel slavery, meaning that them, their children, their children's children, uh, would be slaves for as long for their entire lives. 
right? So we're talking about people who were owned by other people going back to 1619, right? And 1619, um, I think, was became a number that more of us were aware of um, as of last year because it was the 400th anniversary of that time, right? So it's been 400 years since the first slaves were, were uh, sold into slavery. Another kind of number to reflect on um, is the number, is a, the phrase we use in the US called Juneteenth. Juneteenth um, is a celebration of, uh, uh, of the June 19th, 1865, which was the year that the last slaves in the United States were notified of their freedom. And so this was after the end of the Civil War um, in Galveston, Texas. Uh, people who were on slave plantations in Galveston, Texas, uh, news traveled very slowly in those days, and they were the last, um, the last uh, 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 slaves to be given their, or be notified of their freedom, which they'd already had. And so they were working in slavery up until that moment. And that's really celebrated, um, certainly by the black community in the US um, um, as, uh, as Freedom Day, and this, this final you know, nail in the coffin of slavery, which happened um, in 1865. Now, you'll know that's 250 years later from when, um, when the first slaves arrived on our, on our shores. The, uh, another, I think, interesting you know, time point, right? This is 1865, and 100 years later, um, you know, we had uh, images like this. Um, this is Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was a six-year-old girl who um, in Mississippi was, uh, after, after uh, the rules came down to desegregate American schools, requiring that there be, um, that students be allowed to attend schools um, not based on race. And so in 1960, um, this six-year-old girl um, and her family bravely were the first to, to integrate a, uh, an elementary school. And I think what's really remarkable about, um, about this story is, is, that, is that this was done in the face of, of so much vitriol that it required these men who were federal marshals to escort her into her school. So it's sort of hard to imagine um, what that reality would have been like, but that was the reality in 1960. And I just would like to point out that um, this year, Ruby Bridges turned 66, right? This is not history, this is our story. And, uh, and so this is uh, you know, just something to reflect on, I think, when we talk about this moment. Um, if you'll allow me to digress just a little bit to talk about my own history, family history, and how it connects to this. These pictures were taken around the same time that Ruby Bridges was uh, integrating schools. Um, most of you will recognize um, Reverend Martin Luther King um, uh, here in all of these images. The reason why I put this image up, um, you know, Martin Luther King, um, among so many things that he was involved in, voting rights, um, desegregation, uh, the um, uh, you know, fighting for the, the rights of the poor. Um, all of this was really um, initiated through his group, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, the SCLC, of which he was the leader. Um, in this picture, actually, is my great uncle, Reverend Milton Ananias Reed. So he's here in these two different events. Um, what I like about this story is obviously it gives a sort of personal connection to the civil rights movement from, from myself, but it also um, allows me to reflect on sort of what's happening in this moment. And so my, my great uncle was a leader in the SCLC in Virginia. These pictures were taken in Petersburg, Virginia. Petersburg, Virginia was the home of, for example, Robert E. Lee, the, the Confederate general. It's also is, is home to the first public um, uh, college for black uh, students in, um, in uh, uh, Virginia State College, which is still in, in Petersburg, Virginia now. Um, this was, uh, these were events um, hosted around Virginia State College, uh, which they were, uh, uh, you know, these were leaders um, of the black community there. And that really kind of, you know, gives me some, some um, you know, personal reflections on this. Uh, my father, um, my namesake, I'm a junior, my father, Bill Clemens Sr. is pictured here in the middle. This picture was taken roughly around 1969 um, as he was in training on his way to, um, to Vietnam. So he was drafted into the Vietnam War. And, uh, and it, you know, Virginia State College actually is where my father went to university. Um, prior to that, he had spent his entire life in segregated schools. And so he never, up until college, never went to a school um, with, 
white students. And this was from a time when my dad was raised in a neighborhood where he was, they were actually the only black family um, for a long time in their neighborhood. All of his neighbors were white and they all went to a different school. <laughs> And so, you know, some of my, you know, close, uh, my dad's closest friends who um, were, I call uncles and aunts um, were, uh, were his neighbors and they were never allowed to go to the same schools, right? And so this was in 1970, which was roughly the time um, right about before I was born. Um, I was trying to pick a picture to kind of just reflect on myself. Um, that's me on the sort of lower right there. This is my, my, my grandparents and their grandchildren at the time. This picture was taken. Um, probably around 1977, 78, something on that scale, uh, uh, hence the outfits. Um, and, you know, when I look at these pictures of myself as sort of a young man, and then I reflect on sort of, you know, my own education and how I came up, you know, I never um, had, um, you know, as a person being raised uh, a black in America, I never had um, any educators who were black I never had, um, you know, while I did have, um, uh, you know, there were black teachers in my elementary and high school, um, I never actually took classes with any of them, but there were no, there were no um, black uh, uh, role models in terms of my science classes or my university or um, graduate school. And, I, and now as a professor at Caltech, when I teach biochemistry, I recognize that I am the uh, probably the the only black professor that that my students will ever get to meet or be educated by i should say and so i think you know it's really important to sort of just reflect on where we're at and how we got here all right so without going too much farther um i'm down this path since i'm taking way too long i'm um, just to say you know this is our tps dei committee um it's been a great group and already been introduced um the uh you know, when we talk about what success looks like, I think there's some, a, a couple of things to reflect on, but just I think demographics, and I pull these demographics because those are Caltech's sort of relevant numbers. But if we look, you know, our population is roughly 50% um, women. Um, um, the total population in the US is about 60% white, but those numbers are pretty um, shifted when we come to California where I live. And, you know, if we talk about this in any of our societies, both locally and nationally, you know, internationally, you know, can our society be reflected in our institutions? And I think, you know, success to me is that within our local demographics that our, our institutions are representative of our local demographics, because that means that we're reaching everyone. Um, and I do want to point out that a lack of diversity um, you know, may not represent intentional exclusion. I think we didn't get here by the fact that we were just all racist and intentionally um, trying to exclude people. However, um, the, however, the only way to fix where we are, which is what got us to where we are, um, is to take is to do an intentional effort. And so, um, I think this is going to reflect in sort of the things that we say today. Um, the uh, if we you know look at demographics for the types of science that we do, you can pull these numbers from NSF. These are from 2013, so they're a bit old. But this is looking at employment de demographics for bachelor's degree. And if you remember, the US is roughly 60% white, and yet on our bachelor's degrees in the biosciences, it's 72% white, only 6% black, and even 8 7% Latinx. These numbers get significantly worse when we progress um, um, into the PhD, uh, PhD levels. And so, you know, we see a basically a fall off across the board. It's sort of interesting that for women, we have you know, more women get bachelor's, but significantly fewer women get PhDs relative to this. And this is all related to these sort of pipeline issues that, that we um, sort of frequently talk about. Um, we can reflect on these numbers relative to sort of broader science PhDs um, um, in the US and the numbers aren't significantly better there. And so I think this is you know, some, somewhat telling um, in terms of you know, the problems we need to fix. And uh, just to sort of briefly um, talk about the, the, the protein society, you know, I think the protein society, we don't have demographics for, for race and ethnicity, um, but if we just look at our numbers for women, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, not doing so great as a society. And so I think we, even though, um, if you look at our executive council, which is currently 70% women, um, our, uh, our demographics across the board um, don't reflect that. And so, uh, and so we've got work to do. And I think, um, since this is going longer than I was anticipating, um, I will just point out a couple of things. Um, this is already mentioned, our awards. 
you know, if we're going to diversify our awards, it requires that people make nominations. And so please, you know, think about this. This is part of um, the success of our society, but part of the success of promoting um, people from, from underserved demographics requires that we do this work. And so um, for all of you out there listening, please take the time to do that. Um, I do want to highlight our website on diversified protein science. It's a way to, um, uh, uh, for, for, for us to amplify folks who come from diverse backgrounds to think about them for both our symposia, but also for, um, for any sorts of uh, uh, you know, seminar speakers that you have at your own institutions or other structures that you can go to. And so we want to, to uh, uh, increase this, but also uh, uh, use this as a tool to uh, continue to diversify protein science. Um, finally, um, just to introduce our speakers. Um, so we have um, four fantastic speakers today. Um, you know, we as a, the DEI committee basically um, decided on this set of speakers based on our own knowledge of how much they've contributed to diversifying protein science as individuals. And we felt that it would be really great to have them uh, come and talk to us. And so I'll let them introduce themselves, but, um, I, but we're really looking forward to today and looking forward to answering your questions. And I will stop there and then open it up to Mike Summers from UMBC. Uh, thanks so much, Bill. <clears throat> so it's a real pleasure to um, be able to tell you about the Meyerhoff program. I want to start, though, by introducing Freeman Hrabowski. He's shown here. Um, he started at UMBC the same year I did in 1987. And um, Freeman is just uh, an amazing uh, mentor. He was raised in Birmingham. And uh, one of the four little girls that was killed in the Baptist Street Church bombing was a friend of his. And so with a lot of effort, he convinced his parents to let him march in one of the marches. And if you've ever seen the old uh, black and white TV images of the children being sprayed down with water uh, hoses. He was in that group. Uh, he was actually incarcerated for marching at 12 years old for a week in uh, Birmingham uh, jails. Uh, he calls it the most uh, frightening uh, days of his life. And yet he is somehow the most positive individual you will ever meet in your life. He's my mentor and, uh, uh, you know, somehow he continues to use language and, and and approaches that make people want to be part of the solution. And it, I can't imagine how hard that is to do, having gone through the kinds of experiences that he did. So when we both started at UMBC in 1987, the campus was considered racist by our Black students. Uh, they actually held sit-ins in the president's office because of that. Uh, now uh, we're the top school of origin of Black MD PhDs in the US by a long shot. We have been for more than 10 years. We're number two. Uh, the number two school of origin, according to the NSF, behind Black, uh, behind Howard uh, for production of Black STEM PhDs. We actually think we're number one yet now because this uh, survey was done three years ago. And we're considered a national model for inclusive excellence in STEM. The entire campus culture has changed. And I'd encourage you to just uh, Google Hrabowski in 60 minutes. His name is Hrabowski because his great-great-grandfather you no, know, great, great, great grandfather was a white Polish slave owner. And he's Horowski the third because he's the third generation that was born free in the US rather than having to be free. So he started a program called the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. It was started with a half a million dollar gift from a Baltimore philanthropist, Bob Meyerhoff. Uh, the goal was to attract high achieving students to provide intrusive support with very high expectations. It was a different approach from what had been commonly taken in the US. We don't use the word remediation at all. Uh, we use a cohort learning model. There's a lot of evidence that that works well. Students get immersed in research right away. And a really important part of what we do is that we make sure that these students have visible positions on campus. And it's a simply a matter of if you've got 25 or 30 black kids in your, in your cohort, we want them sitting together in the front of the class asking questions so that people see these high achieving students. And the impact of that visibility and that high achievement has been uh, almost immeasurable. We've had 1,500 total Meyerhoff participants 
71% of them are minorities. I should point out right now, this program originally focused only on black males because that's what Bob Meyerhoff was worried about. It was opened up to black females a year later, and then a few years later, it was opened up to any student who cares about social justice and, and inclusion and is interested in pursuing an advanced degree in science. And so it tends to be self-selective. About 15% of the students historically have been white and another 15% have been Asian. We've had uh, over 1,100 graduates that uh, with 91% of them retained in STEM. I mean, think about that because they're coming into the program at 17 years old, but they wanna be a scientist at 17. Uh, we've had 930 graduates per, per, uh, pursue professional degrees. You can see we've had over 300 PhDs awarded. 92% of them are minorities, so it's not like it's only the majority of students that are getting the degrees. 59 MD PhDs, and we have uh, quite a few master's students. Another uh, 258 currently enrolled in graduate school, and again, 81% of those are minorities. Most of them African American. The program has obviously had a big impact on UMBC. Right now, if you're a black student who comes into UMBC and you're not a part of any program, your chances of graduating after four years are the same as if you're a white student. Uh, GPAs uh, now for black students are equal to or higher than the average white student on campus. But we've had an impact beyond UMBC. Jerome Adams, our US Surgeon General, you've probably seen him on television. He was one of our early Meyerhoff scholars. Uh, the uh, Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary for Health, uh, Sylvia Trent Adams is a Meyerhoff Scholar. We have now, actually we now have 50, I just didn't get them all on this slide, former Meyerhoff Scholars who now hold faculty positions around the country, and they're at some pretty good places. Four of them are at Duke University. These are tenured or tenure track faculty positions. We have a couple at Stanford, we have about four at Hopkins. These are all the other Research One universities where these former Meyerhoff undergrads now hold um, faculty positions. Some of them are already tenured. Now people have said all along, well, you're just cherry picking, you're just picking the best of the best. Um, well, you know, is that true and, and what's really going on? So when we bring students and their families in for our selection weekend, and this happens when they're high school seniors, they learn about our program, they learn about the expectations and we get their parents to sign forms that say, if we make your son or daughter an offer of a scholarship and you turn us down to go to the Ivies, that we can track them. And these are all kids that say they want to be a scientist. And they've had, many of them have had research uh, in high school. And so, uh, so, you know, we have this now control group. Historically, about half the students go to the Ivies and half come to the UMBC. And the students who decline, it turns out they do graduate with similar high GPAs, around 3.8 is the average but they're only half as likely to graduate with a STEM degree and they're seven times less likely to pursue a STEM graduate degree. So yeah, we are bringing high achieving, well-prepared students to our campus. Those students are serving as role models, not only for the white faculty, but like me, but for the other black students who don't have the same preparation for all the white students. And it has just led to a huge change in campus culture. And we are having a, a, a positive effect on the students. Now, uh, the Meyerhoff program at the undergraduate level started getting a lot of attention early on. And we started looking, the faculty started looking at what we were doing at the graduate level. And we realized, you know, we could be contributing to this. In fact, I think that's the genius of Freeman. There was no arm twisting. There was no getting us all in a room and saying, you know, Mike, you were raised in the South. You're a white guy. You're not really doing things right. You, you should be doing a better job. It, by seeing these students, by having them come into our labs, by working with them, in, in almost in day one, we looked in the mirror, all of my colleagues and said, wow, we could be doing so much more. So we looked at our graduate, our PhD production, and this shows PhDs awarded at UMBC to minorities by year. And Meyerhoff, again, it was started in 1989. So this is a binary chart, right? This is 0001. 0, 0, 0, 0. So these are graduate students at UMBC, not our undergrads. So um, with one grant from the NIH and really very little administrative input, it was all input really by the faculty, we started a what we call the Meyerhoff Graduate Fellows Program. This is one of our early retreats. You can see we started with only a few students. Within a few years, we had a dozen and then two dozen students. And now this is the growth of the program. 
These are the students supported by that one IMSD NIH grant out of NIGMS. And what you can see is in the early days, faculty would only select students if, they, if we would support them. And then as they started seeing the benefits, they started supporting. So more than half of our incoming students now are supported by departments and, and uh, training grants because and we basically help them recruit those students. And here's that chart I showed you, and now it's extended, and you can see what the results look like. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't update this chart, but these are updated numbers. We've had now 128 minority PhDs from 2000 to 2020, and this compares the six from the, in the 10-year period prior to our program. We have 84% retention rate. 112 minorities are currently enrolled in our program in the fall of 2020. So it's been a huge, we've had a huge impact. Meyerhoff is considered by many to be a gold standard for inclusive excellence in STEM at the undergrad and the grad level. Can it be adopted at other institutions? I can't tell you how many times I'd go and talk about Meyerhoff and people would say, well, you can do that because you're in a Baltimore suburb. You've got Washington DC and Bethesda right nearby. You know, you're, you have 15% of your students are black and we only have a smaller percentage. We could never do that. Plus, and here was the catch, you have Freeman Hrabowski as president. So the assumption everybody was making is that you could only do this if you have a dynamic, charismatic black leader like we had on our campus. And that just begged the experiment. And so uh, I went to Hughes and asked if they would support an experiment to see if Meyerhoff could be replicated at other institutions, majority institutions with like-minded leadership. And so we chose North Carolina and Penn State. These are very different institutions from UMBC. We have about 11,000 undergrads, about 34% minorities, 17% African-American. UNC is a larger school, but half the minority participation, only 8% African-American, and they had a pretty poor history of inclusion. You probably saw the, the toppling of the statue just a couple years ago that led to the firing of their president. Uh, and only four black freshmen admitted by 1960. Penn State, we were really uh, not sure this was gonna work at all at Penn State. 41,000 undergraduates, only 12% minorities, only 5% African-American, yet they're one of the top five schools of origin of PhDs, STEM PhDs in the country. They produce 193 undergraduates per year who go on to earn a PhD somewhere in STEM. But of that 193, only four per year African-American. Again, these are NSF data over a period of 10 years. Their chief diversity officer said this would never work here because parents won't trust us with their children. It's a very isolated environment. So we started a partnership where we had immersive training at UMBC where their faculty who wanted to do this and their administrators would come and be part of our summer bridge and part of our selection process and learn how do we do things then we had on-site mentoring at their institutions. When they had their selection weekend, I went out there. Meyerhoff undergraduates went out there. Our parent association went out to meet with parents at these other schools to tell them about Meyerhoff and what we were gonna help their institutions do. Bi-weekly staff meetings and a lot of other things I don't really have time to go into. These partnerships are ongoing to this day. We still meet monthly. And the outcomes way exceeded expectations. STEM retention matches Meyerhoff. It's about 90%. This is the first year of Meyerhoff way back 30 years ago. And this is the retention after six years. And you can see in the very first cohorts that these two campuses, they match present day Meyerhoff cohorts of retention and graduation after four years. Um, GPAs at graduation. Meyerhoff, we had a lot to learn. It took us a while to build up the, uh, our programs, but based on what we learned, we could convey that information to these other campuses. And you can see the GPAs at UNC and Penn State match uh, present day, Meyer, the 28 year average of Meyerhoff. Uh, PhD matriculation, UMBC originally only had one or two that went on to PhD or MD PhD, a lot went to med school. You can see Penn State in year one and uh, UNC in year one, and then this is present day Meyerhoff. So they're already performing at or very close to Meyerhoff uh, in terms of the outcomes where the students go. They were growing at a high rate, just like we grew, and institutional support was very high. They are, they're putting institutional dollars into their program. In fact, Penn State started their program their first year. They had no outside support. They said they would do it on, they'll do it on their own if that's what they have to do. 
that just shows what kind of upper administration commitment they made. But they also wrote their programs into their, into their uh, capital campaigns and their endowments after just two years of fundraising. You can see UNC raised $16 million and Penn State $12 million just in two years. And so there, there's a significant return on the investment. These are the Millennium Scholars at Penn State at one of the dinners with the president. These are the Chancellor's Science Scholars at one of the dinners with their former president, uh, Carol Folt, uh, who's now the chancellor at USC be because of her sticking up for supporting the students who wanted to get rid of this statue at Penn State. We're expanding it even more, just so you'll know, the three of us, having worked together now for about seven years, have a terrific partnership where we're helping Berkeley and San Diego, and this is being supported by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Howard University is part of our consortium. Small schools have been involved. The University of West Florida, my alma mater is involved, and we're talking to other schools. In fact, HHMI now uh, is interested in having a driving changes uh, uh, program. It got put on hold because of COVID, but we're expecting to be involved with them with, with those activities as well. And I'll just end with this last side. If you're in the audience, you might be saying, well, what can I do? You know, I don't have a president like Freeman, my institution. I would say if you're a student, what really worked at my alma mater was there were a few minority students who got together and decided, well, we're, we want to do something. They organized the club. They got faculty to help them with their club that came up with money for monthly meetings, for drinks and, I mean, food and, and beverages. Uh, they asked if they could have minorities come and give seminars, and that actually got the faculty more involved and empowered the faculty. Now they have federal funding for a major diversity effort on their own. So I would say if you're an undergraduate, you have a lot more power than you think. If you're a faculty member, you could organize a student club. You could find out from the students that have been successful in their junior or senior year, you know, what made them successful? How could they expand? How could you as an institution expand what made them successful? Provide a safe space for students so that they can talk when they're upset and angry. And that's a real common problem these days. But how do they express that anger in a way that doesn't hurt themselves academically or professionally? You need to help them do that. You can push for administrative support once you have this cohort together. And I think the administration has really important role the, chan the president of Penn State said at a meeting, I'll never forget, this was his exact quote, diversity uh, in, in, in inclusion is not an assignable responsibility. You have to analyze, you should start by analyze institutional outcomes, identify campus champions, establish resources and fundraising, prior fundraising priorities. If you put your program into the capital campaign, the, the campus pays attention and then learn from successful programs. And, and in this case, I would say the administration does have the power, just don't be afraid to use it. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. As always, I was uh, both uh, impressive and exciting and motivating. And um, just to remind everyone, we are leaving all the questions to the end. If you have a specific question for Mike, um, some of you had questions about numbers, um, he can address those directly in the Q&A. So if you put those there, we will address those as we go through. Um, next up is Leroy Jones. All right, thank you, Bill. Can everyone see my screen? Good. All right, yes. excellent, excellent. Well, I just wanted to uh, first just thank the Protein Society Executive Council for uh, just giving me an opportunity to talk about something that's um, very, very uh, dear to my heart. Uh, actually, Bill and I um, actually kind of met virtually for the first time last summer and just started some conversations and um, he asked would I uh, you know serve on this webinar so just thanks to the committee once again and then of course you know to all of our panel um, members so I want to talk about fostering relationships with minority serving institutions uh, so I am at Chicago State University it is a predominantly black institution um, when it originally was founded it was not it was a teaching institution and even once it moved to its present campus, um, it was a majority um, environment. However, you know, as the um, as Roseland kind of urbanized, um, you know, the shade started to change. So it changed to more, you know, black and brown, you know, as opposed to um, you know, being a more white white students. So just to give you just a little idea, you know, of my background and how I ended up. At Chicago State University, it really was not my my intention. Um, I did my undergrad at Bradley University, and 
Peoria, Illinois. I then went on to the University of South Carolina and uh, did a PhD in organic chemistry working for Jim Tor, who's now at Rice University. I left there and did a postdoc with Bob Grubbs at, um, at Caltech. And um, I went straight to industry. So I went to work for um, Amico Research Center up in Naperville, and which became BP Amico, which ultimately became BP. But one of the things that you know, I saw you know, as I was advancing in uh, my education as well as in my profession, um, there just was not enough people that looked like me. You know, so like Bill, you know, saying a little bit earlier, you know, um, I never had the privilege, you know, while I was um, in undergrad or grad school and even as a postdoc, you know, to sit in the class, you know, where um, a minority, you know, was actually teaching, you know, teaching that class. Um, so, you know, being there, you know, at Amico, a BP Amico, you know, I decided, you know, to go back into the academy to see if I could, you know, impact that in some sort of way. And that's how I ended up at uh, Chicago State University. Now, I, I remember when I first was preparing to do that, you know, my wife thought I was crazy because it was about a $40,000 differential in pay, you know, moving from industry, you know, down to uh, back to the academy. But I must say, you know, it has paid dividends, you know, with just the work that I've been able to do um, in the area of uh, recruiting, retaining, progressing, and graduating underrepresented minorities in STEM and seeing them matriculating into PhD programs as well as into the STEM workforce. So um, I'm currently the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Chicago State University, the biggest college there. Um, but prior to that, I really spent 20 years, um, you know, just working in outreach programs, along with being a professor um, of chemistry um, in, my, in my department. So in my early years, I started with the NSF, you know, funded program, the Illinois Lewis Stokes Alliance, for minority participation, spent several years there, working with about 15 institutions, including one government lab throughout the state of Illinois. Um, I then jumped over and did some partnerships um, with uh, community colleges, you know, in our urban STEM talent expansion program, you know, just trying to, you know, uh, increase that pipeline, getting those students not to stop out and to pursue uh, BSs um, in STEM. Um, I then, you know, um, got pretty aggressive um, and, and went after a grant, a PBI grant from um, the um, Department of Education to create a Center for STEM Education and Research. And one of the things that I saw, you know, with our students, even though, you know, our uh, campus uh, was predominantly black, um, was that students didn't quite know where to go to take advantage of opportunities. So I created this center that was really kind of a one-stop shop, you know, for um, students to come in and and be able to access all of these type of outreach programs and opportunities you know, on, on campus. And uh, that later expanded into a regional you know, center that impacted you know, 15 students, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 15 institutions um, um, right there in the Midwest. And then ultimately that landed me at the National Science Foundation where I served as a project director um, for the um, LSM program. So that's a little bit about, about my background. Now, I, I really want to present this to you as considerations. So, you know, one slide I'm going to cover institutional cons considerations, another one faculty considerations, and then the last slide is really going to be student co considerations, and then just leave you with just a couple of um, recommendations. Um, so first with institutional considerations, and this is really me speaking as a, you know, as a, as a dean. I, I think that the first thing that you have to really investigate if you're seeking a partner or build relationships with the MSI is really learning what their mission is. And what you'll find, you know, with most HBCUs as well as MSIs, HSIs, and PBIs is that it's really a twofold mission. So early on, you know, it had to deal with kind of social justice, you know, educating promising people of color. You know, but I think since that time, it has really kind of expanded into a social mission of kind of reaching undeserved populations that might not have higher education opportunities. So, of course, that can be ethnic minorities, you know, that could be um, uh, people with disabilities, you know, it can be, it can be women, also first generation students. So, so really, you know, that's kind of the mission, you know, of most MSIs and HSIs. So, a lot of times when I present it with these, with these opportunities, um, the first question that I ask is, you know, who does it really benefit and how? Um, I can remember when I first came on as a young faculty member um, at Chicago State, I had a, um, a big school in the area reach out to me and they asked, you know, that I work on one of the projects. 
And uh, they offered me, you know, $50,000, you know, um, over three years to do it. And um, I remember uh, one of the senior faculty members coming to me a little bit later and saying, hey, Leroy, you need to go back and ask them, you know, um, what's the total, you know, what's the total grant? You know, and, and what I found out was that the total grant was actually five million, you know, over, you know, those, those three years, you know, so, you know, the benefit um, really wasn't for me per se, you know, I was on there was another motivation, you know, that I will be, um, be sure to talk about. But one of the things that, you know, uh, from an MSI perspective, you know, there's value in diverse and collaborative you know, relationships. You know, one thing that it de definitely does for majority institutions is just kind of increase cultural competency, which is something that's very, very important with understanding, you know, different sensitivities, you know, in this, in this area. Of course, you know, when you're dealing with MSIs, you know, it's a pipeline to a diverse pool, you know, of students. So we have very eager students, very bright students um, who might not have been given, you know, a proper chance. They might have came in unprepared. Um, so it really gives you an opportunity to, you know, collaborate with these, with these students. And then the other thing, you know, working with the MSI, you know, you have access to particular grant awards. So for example, you know, working at the National Science Foundation, you know, of, of course, the number, the, number, the, the number one thing is intellectual merit, but the other is broadening participation, you know, broader impacts, you know, so a lot of times we're approached, you know, for, for that reason. So once I kind of look at these, you know, sort of things, you know, I, I have to say, you know, well, how does it benefit, you know, the MSI? How does it benefit the university? And, and a couple of really three things come to mind that you really have to be able to, to speak to. The first thing is just has to do with resource, you know, capacity. So what does it do for me in terms of enhancing my faculty, uh, research and lab equipment, facilities, you know, as well as degree programming at, you know, at my institutions. Another area is just sustainability. You know, what we found out is that a lot of times, you know, once the money leaves, the partnership also leaves. So we're really looking for something that can help us kind of promote the MSI expansion, as well as our own, you know, independence, you know, when it comes to from the research. And then, of course, the last thing is just, just scholarship. You know, so even with that, you know, what's, you know, what's going to be the measurable contribution to the scientific literature? You know, I mean, how does it increase, you know, um, MSI faculty chances, you know, at publications or receiving, receiving more grants? So just a couple of institutional considerations. Now take a look at some faculty considerations, looking at it through the eyes of, you know, the faculty. Um, the first thing that I want to stress, you have to enter these relationships understanding that it's a relationship between equals. Um, you will be, be surprised, you know, at some of the situations that I've heard throughout the nation um, when um, faculty at MSIs are approached by majority institutions. Please keep in mind that a lot of these faculty come from very stellar backgrounds. So you've heard my background. I have faculty at Chicago State, you know, that are from UMBC. I have faculty, you know, at um, Chicago State, you know, that's from the University of Michigan. Um, faculty of Chicago State is from the University of Illinois, you know, so, and, you know, they're, they're just great researchers in their, in their own right. And they've really kind of sacrificed their research agendas to come to a Chicago State or MSI, you know, because they really believe in, believe in the mission. Um, so with that being said, you know, it's, it, it's very, very important, you know, that, um, that you understand that the, MI, the MSI relationship is really a value added. So to have a relationship with uh, MSI, you know, brings new ideals, it brings different perspectives, you know, and approaches to, to solving problems. One limitation that I do just want to point out, you know, just, just in terms of research barriers, because a lot of times you don't see a lot of, you know, research coming out of, you know, these type of institutions. And a lot of that has to do with institutional challenges, especially as it pertains to financial constraints and also um, facilities. So it's not uncommon, you know, um, at an MSI or HBCU, you know, for um, the teachers to have high teaching loads. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I can have a student, you know, teaching up to 12 credit hours, you know, in, in, a, in, an, in an academic semester, 24 in a year. And then, you know, the other piece of it is you know, oftentimes they do their own, class, their own class um, preparation. And then, of course, that's with little to no, you know, release 
the least time. So these faculty are very guarded, you know, when they're looking to partner um, with, with people because they really want true partnerships. So one of the things to your consideration is just, you know, what does true partnership look like? The first thing is just pure motivations. You know, so a lot of times, you know, people come, you know, um, you know, with altruistic, um, you know, motives, you know, you have some others, you know, that kind of have the missionary syndrome. And then you have some that's just approaching you because in a particular grant that they're applying to, they're the diversity mandate. You know, um, know that people, you know, at the university can really see straight through those type of things. The other thing is just be transparent and, and clear in your communications and what your expectations are, you know, of the grant. You know, I have been on grants where I was told one thing and then when the grant finally came out, you know, it was pitched a totally different way. So you just want to make sure that you hold true, you know, to um, what you're communicating and being transparent with, with your expectation of the, of the MSI. Another one is just respect and ownership of ideals. Once again, it's a relationship between equals, you know, and we want your motiva motivations to be pure, you know, so, you know, you have to respect each other's ideals and, you know, not take ideals, you know, as, you know, as your own. And then another big piece of this is just the, the value of the outreach efforts. Keep in mind, you know, what our mission is and, and what we're trying to do, you know, so we're really trying to pull more students, you know, into, you know, into these STEM fields. And then, of course, it's just increased publications and, and grantsmanship. Real quickly, just some student considerations to, to think about, you know, when you're dealing with URM students. And um, surely, you know, Mike um, can um, resonate with this. You know, the first thing is recognize that URM students bring value to, you know, your, your institution. You know, so with that, you know, being, being said, you know, they have to be made to felt welcome. So it has to be a sense of belonging and putting programming you know, around, around that. The other thing with students, and I heard a faculty member once say this, and, and, and I really liked it, it just kind of stuck with me. You know, you know, URM students, they come with sensibility, not disabilities. You know, so you have to kind of be sensitive you know, to their cultural environment and what they bring to your particular environment. And then once again, just being transparent and clear you know, in your communication with these students. Also realize that for most of these students, it's a cultural adjustment you know, for them. They've come out of institutions that were predominantly Black, predominantly Hispanic, um, or some, you know, eth um, ethnic race, you know. So um, you want to make sure that you, you foster, you know, an environment that's culturally sensitive, that's affirming, you know, and that provides plenty of mentorship as well as um, career development um, awareness. And then the last there is just maximizing the URM educational experience. And I really take a lot of this you know, from um, my time being at the NSF and just developing programs, you know, that, um, that, um, that integrates academics, you know, as well as social integration, professional integration, as well as some of the others. The next chart real quickly is just something real quick just, just kind of shows just in case you have a question about, you know, what, you know, academic, social and professional integration activities look like. And you can see in several categories, they can bridge um, several areas. Last slide that I want to leave with you, and then I'll turn it over to the next speaker, is just some recommendations. And um, Bill spoke to this a little bit earlier, he read my mind. Be intentional, not reactionary. You know, too often, you know, people are re reactionary, you know, when things happen, you know, like the George Floyd incident. You will be surprised at the number of institutions that have reached out to Chicago State, you know, since this, since this happened. You know, so we're trying to figure out, okay, who do we partner with? Is it sincere? What's their motivation before we move forward? Move forward. The other thing, you know, form a working group to discuss and implement DEI initiatives, you know, on your, on your campus. The third one is just seek targeted partnerships that enhance MSI capacity rather than create dependency. You know, so once again, you know, see where your missions align, you know, see, you know, um, where you have some things in common. You'll find out that those will be the best, you know, partnerships. The other thing is leverage and integrate DEI EI supported activities, you know, on your campus, you know, so, many, so oftentimes we try to go with this thing along, you know, when, you know, we can do better, you know, when we're together. And then the last thing is be sure to establish and not only establish, but support specific initiatives to recruit, retain, progress, and graduate URM students. 
So that's all that I have for you. Please consider uh, those things you know, that I talked about as well as these recommendations. And I look forward to um, having discussions with you later on um, during the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. Again, that was really uh, you know, very sage advice and I think really um, helpful for a lot of us as we navigate this, uh, this new, new normal. Okay, uh, Carla Matos is up next from Northeastern. Can you see my screen? Yep, you're okay. good. Okay, um, I'm thrilled to be here um, and um, be talking to you today about my personal experience and journey in um, diversifying protein science. So I am a protein scientist and I, my, my research uh, focuses on um, the structural biology of RAS GTPases and their binding partner in signal transduction cascades. Um, and I'm also the director of graduate studies um, in the chemistry department at Northeastern University. And I will talk to you mainly about my role in building community and diversifying our graduate students. So my talk today will uh, start with a brief background to give you context of how I started uh, to work on this um, issue and, and, and then progressed at various levels of the academy. Um, then I will go on to the second part of the talk, which I will be uh, telling you about working directly with students, building trust and building community. And trust is key here um, in this, this whole uh, journey. Um, and then make the end with the point that um, institutional support is key in making all of this happen. So when I first started as a um, assistant professor, um, starting my own lab, my top priority and goal was to create a thriving um, and excellent research program, um, including a diversity of students, of the kinds of people that we have in our society, because in that I knew would have to look very different from the excellent labs that I actually was trained in, but were primarily white. So from the very beginning, I was at NC State, and we did have a, a significant amount of um, African-American students and Latino students, but they were not um, getting PhDs in chemistry. Um, later, after I, I became a tenured uh, professor and moved to Northeastern, I uh, started to try to um, work at the departmental and the university level as well as the national level. And here are some of the examples. Um, at the departmental level, I uh, went to, you know, did the, the train the trainer work, workshop on national research mentoring network and uh, run several workshops to train our faculty uh, to uh, be more sensitive to uh, diver the diversity of our students and their backgrounds and culture. Um, I was part of STRIDE also at the university level um, where we had, we're a group to develop a strategy and tactics for recruiting a faculty to include uh, diversity and excellence in our hiring practices. And we also developed workshops to train faculty who were in search committees. Um, I'm part of the Women of Color in, in, in the Academy, which has really uh, thrived in the, in the Boston area. Um, and at the uh, also university level, I am a, a co-PI on an LSEP grant, which is, has the, the title of STARS, Strategic Advancement of Rising Scholars at Northeastern. And we have a nice and vibrant group of, of scholars who are going through that program. At the national level, very early on, I got connected quality education for minorities, um, and I helped run workshops for faculty at minority serving institutions, uh, partnered with the NSF. Um, and, uh, and for several years, I, I was part of the postdoctoral enrichment program supported by the Boroughs Welcome Fund um, and uh, read applications to support 
postdoctoral fellows who are from underrepresented minorities. So this is just kind of a, a background, a few things that I've, I, that I've tried to do over my career. Um, and I also should say, after I got tenured, I deliberately focused all of my service in the department, at the university level, and at the national level, whenever I could, on diversity issues. So uh, while I kept my research program going, I also kept this focus on diversifying um, our uh, workforce. So here's a picture of my group uh, taken last year. And the thing I wanted to point out here is that half of us are from underrepresented minority groups. And what this does is, is really key. Everyone is different. And what we don't have in the group is somebody who has to worry about um, being the other and different one. So the point I wanna make here is that critical mass really makes a difference and it minimizes this sense of other. And the result of that is that all the students can focus on doing science rather than worrying about being judged or whether they're uh, you know, fitting in or worrying about being excluded. So I think that is, um, you know, and that, that to develop this comes with challenges along the way, um, but it, it's actually doable and we're in a really excellent place. I'm very proud of um, the fact that we have such diversity in our lab. So that was my, my lab itself, but I also felt like I could really make a difference at the departmental level. In, 19, in, in um, 2013, the then chair of our department asked if I would be director of graduate studies. And I said, yes, um, if you understand that my top priority is going to be to diversify um, and, and while at increasing excellence of our graduate program. And um, I was graduate, uh, uh, director of graduate studies for five years. Um, Penny Boyney, my colleague, was then followed for two years. And I just became uh, director of graduate studies again after she became chair of the department. So um, during these years, we have significantly increased representation in our department. I'm, I'm very proud of that. And um, I want to share with you uh, some of the things that I did. Um, very early on in 2013, I partnered with uh, one of my colleagues, shown here on the right, Oyinda Oyelaran, um, to uh, develop and apply for an RU program. And we both agreed that we would um, focus this RU program on um, a, a diverse set of institutions that of uh, often did not, were not our one institution and we wanted to bring students in to our summer programs to have um, a research experience, get to know us, and with the hope that many of them would end up applying to our program. And today we have several students who came through our REU program and indeed uh, did apply. And I wanted to point out the column on the right, you, you see that um, only, uh, uh, two of our uh, uh, initial cohort identified as white. Um, so we're very proud of that. That program has continued. We're very grateful for the NSF to have supported us on this. And it's an effort that I think really helped to jumpstart um, the, the di diversification of our department. Um, so here are some of the things that um, we do in the department to support um, uh, students in our PhD program, the, the minority students and all students. Um, and I'll just go briefly through uh, these, these different examples. So we have a very active graduate student association and I work directly with, the, with all of our graduate students. I know them personally. I know all of our graduate students very well. Um, and we strive for transparent communication and I serve as a conduit um, to our faculty. So we, we have communication, good communication between the GSA and our faculty. We talk about uh, the issues of the GSA and think what's important at faculty meeting. And I think that's a, a, a good way for the students to have a voice. Um, we have a, a chapter of the Alliance for Diversity in Science and Engineering, uh, which is a collaborative and active chapter um, 
of a national organization, which is led by students and co-founded by one of our own junior faculty, Stephen Lopez, who brought it here uh, to Northeastern, and it's now uh, well and alive and going. Uh, we have a faculty member that was uh, awarded um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute grant to train faculty and students in support of diversity in science. Um, we have strong women leadership representation in chemistry and with an increasingly diverse faculty that's one of the top priorities is to have um, more faculty from, from underrepresented groups um, because as was mentioned before this is really key to have mentors um, who who really have uh, uh, understand the experience of being a student of color in uh, in uh, science today um, we have a departmental diversity committee with active student participation and uh, this summer uh, we started a um, monthly discussions focused on racial biases and injustice and this um, is a group that meets uh, once a month and has participants include student, faculty, and staff. And we discuss um, either podcasts or books or movies that have to do with the, this topic of racial bias and injustice in order to educate and sensitize ourselves to these issues. So as examples, in the last three months, we've um, discussed uh, a podcast called Skin Deep, uh, this coming um, uh, this coming Friday, we're going to be discussing 1619, which is a series of six episodes describing the experience of the, of the, of the slavery in America starting from the very first ship that came, which uh, Bill Clemens alluded to. And um, in December, we'll be discussing white fragility which is really uh, about white privilege uh, and the frameworks in our society that uh, promote white privilege and exclude people of color. So this is, the, this is really key to have these conversations. They're often very hard conversations to have, but I really feel they are part of the, the fabric that allows our students to understand each other and for, um, for, for us to create an environment of inclusion. And then I also notice that very often in the GSA and sometimes in the, um, the uh, conversations on racial bias and social justices, there were some, some students who were silent. And when I, when I really paid attention to it, many of the students who were silent were students of color. So I, I started to actually um, reach out and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with our underrepresented minority students uh, to talk about um, these issues, issues, all, all sorts of things. A lot of our conversations just started, you know, chatting about how things were going for them, you know, so that so that the, um, the students are not necessarily put on the spot of, so tell me what are your problems, you know, it, that, that wasn't the way the conversation uh, necessarily has to go. You can start by just getting to know the students, just asking how things are going and their research. And, you know, in this way, you develop a relationship and you develop trust. And through this process, um, we, uh, I, we have two, two um, uh, kind of processes going. One is that the, under, the, the students who are underrepresented minorities are actually now talking amongst themselves and to come up with a series of action plans that we could do in our department to, to really make things better for um, the, stu the, the underrepresented minority students. And the other, and at the same time, I'm having, continuing these one-on-one -on -one conversations and not only with the underrepresented minority students, but with all of our students around the issues that we need to um, resolve in our department. And last but not least, I'd like to mention that um, we have a very vibrant uh, seminar series um, and with a mandate from the College of Science to have 50% of our speakers be either women and underrepresented minority faculty for our seminar. So that's a, a goal that we, um, are striving to achieve and we actually have been 
um, able to do that. And you do that by going outside of your regular circle of networks where you know mainly people that, you know, that, that are m m mostly like you. And, to, and so we have a resource of, um, in the College of Science, supported by the College of Science that we can tap into and really diversify our uh, seminar uh, speakers. And we have had tremendously excellent even better seminars than you could possibly imagine. And, and, and aided, you know, ironically, by the fact that we can zoom in people from all over the country or world. So that's really been something that um, has played to our advantage. And lastly, I want to finish with talking about the fact that institutional support is really key. So one of the things that I get as director of graduate studies is a teaching release. And that really has allowed me to put the time and effort that it takes to get to know the students individually and establish these programs um, and things like our uh, social justice discussions and education and sensitization of our uh, student and faculty. That takes a lot of time and energy. And I am very grateful for this teaching release because I don't think I could do that and maintain a thriving research program if I didn't have that. Um, the College of uh, Science Dean, Hazel Siv, who has um, joined us uh, in the summer, created a new position for Associate Dean for Ed Equity. Um, and uh, there's very good coordination between our department, the um, college and the university. And I think that's really important to give um, credibility and also to validate the work that we're doing. Uh, and uh, the College of Science has really um, changed its structure and is making diversity and equity a part of everything we do. And um, to make that clear and to um, make that happen, um, we have open and transparent communication with faculty, and, uh, including faculty and student, through regular town hall meetings where our dean is and, uh, and associate deans are there to have discussions, answer questions, and support us in these endeavors. Um, and the diversity expectations now are made very, very clear. And those expectations come with support which is really exciting because for me, um, when I first started uh, doing this, I really felt like I had to take my own initiative and um, make whatever sacrifices I needed to make to, 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 to do this, starting in my lab and then as director of graduate studies. And right now the situation has totally changed and I feel very, very much supported and as part of a team, um, which is really exciting. So this is my um, last slide, and I want to leave you with a few takeaways. The first one is that change requires effort, very deliberate effort that takes time and resources that take money. It doesn't just happen. So we need to, it requires building trust and credibility with the students that are outside of the mainstream white culture. And that doesn't also just happen. Um, we need to listen and be sensitive to different points of views. We need to refrain from judging and dismissing perspective and experiences of students of color. Be educated on our history regarding race and opportunity disparities. And to build community, we need to build trust and credibility. And all of this takes a lot of energy and I'm grateful that um, I have the time and support to be able to dedicate specifically to these endeavors. And with that, I want to thank you for um, being here and listening. Um, I also want to thank all of my students over the years, the students that I've met through the Graduate Student Association, my colleagues, faculty and staff, um, the NSF, who has been a partner not only in supporting research, but in supporting the RU programs and other um, endeavors that we've taken, the QEM, the PDP uh, groups, and uh, Northeastern. 
Um, I specifically want to acknowledge Oyinda Oyelaran, who started the RU program with me. She is now about to step at, in as an uh, Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs, and I really look forward to working with her in that capacity. Penny Boyney, who is chair of our chemistry department, chemistry and chemical biology, and has been incredibly supportive of all of these efforts that um, uh, we've been making, and actually a partner in many of them. Um, Tara Lashiava, who's our academic coordinator, without whom uh, we couldn't, none of this could possibly happen because she actually organizes and coordinates a lot of this. Randall Hughes, our new Associate Dean for Equity. Um, and finally, Hazel Siv, who is our new Dean of, College, of the College of Science. And I am tremendously grateful for all the restructuring effort and support that uh, COS, the College of Science, has been putting in this effort of diversifying um, uh, our science. Okay, so with that, I end my talk and pass Thank it on you, to Barbara. the next speaker. Uh, that was really, uh, you know, highlights the importance of our institutions putting the work in and, uh, and supporting those of us who, who have been doing the work and are willing to, uh, to do this work too. But also I think it's important to note that, that, that this needs to be work that's considered part of academic work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this is not, um, in addition to academic work, this is part of it. Okay, exactly. so final speaker, Jane, coming to us from England. You may not be unmuted, Jane, because we're not hearing you. Sorry, that was it. You missed me saying thank you, Bill. Thank you for, to everybody for inviting me today. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Cambridge in the UK, and I am bringing a, a different perspective to this talk today. We didn't really decide exactly what we were all going to be talking about, and I want to bring a perspective which is far less local, far more um, uh, international in, in some sense, and far more philosophical. Um, I, I, I think that one of the questions that we really need to address if we're going to, if we're going to do, um, to address this question of diversity in science is, is just say, why is it important? Um, you know, it could be important a bit because it's the right thing to do. And, and we have heard this, this, this presented here today. Um, and, um, uh, and because, you know, through diversity science, we should be combating inequality, misogyny, racism, and all the ills of society through the work we do. And of course, this is the duty of a citizen. And all this is fine and dandy. Um, but um, one of the reasons I'm so angry about the fact of this is because we are wasting so much talent um, in, in our in our communities, in our scientific communities, through um, the lack of diversity. But I also want to uh, ask, ask, argue that we should care about diversity in science as scientists, because good scientific research is absolutely fundamental to the health of the planet and all the people in it. Um, and if you want my evidence for that, well, here you go, climate change. Um, you in California, um, people in the Arctic, we here with the terrible storms we've had all the summer, uh, we've had the, the effect of man-made climate change is clear and we need science to first of all, persuade people that we have it and then affect it. And of course, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and so the need for excellent science, worldwide excellent science is, has never been clearer. I secondly want to argue that we need to care about it because diversity will lead to better science. Well, where's the evidence of this? Because we know there is evidence that diverse teams uh, work better. Um, there's good evidence from the McKinsey company. I hope you've read uh, actually their cases. It, it, we scientists shouldn't stick our heads in the in the scientific sand. We should look outside. And McKinsey has done for the part for three years or three sets of reports in a row, where they have demonstrated that companies with diverse executive teams are the companies that perform best. 
uh, both in terms of gender and, and in ethnic diversity. And this is international across the board. Um, I'd be very interested to hear some of your programs, but I'm taking this sort of international and wider um, because I think we know that science is international and that's what we should be thinking. And I would argue very strongly um, that um, diverse teams give us better science. Um, and, and if you want to know why, it's because really of my philosophy of science. Scientific research is, is trying to find out something we didn't know. We are curious. We look at the world around us and we say, how does that work? What could I do to change that? It's a research into, into the unknown. And if we are going to really research and discover things that we don't know the answer to, then we have to have research environments where we include people with different skills who look at problems in a different way. And one of the words that I think is really key here is inclusion. That is including people from the beginning and making sure that everybody can contribute what they have to contribute. We need to build research environments where we will be challenged out of our secure place. If we're going to discover new things, we have to be prepared to be surprised, to stop looking at things in the same way we've always looked at them and to think at things differently. We need, we need to build environments where hierarchy, deference, power and knowledge and wisdom are constantly under scrutiny. Here I am, I am now, um, I didn't tell you who I am at the beginning. Um, uh, I'm at Cambridge University. I'm head of one of the Cambridge colleges. I'm fellow of the Royal Society, which is like being a, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. I'm one of these sort of senior people um, in, in one of the biggest in, uh, and most respected academic institutions in the world. And I'm calling for people to challenge that power and hierarchy. Because what I think I want to organize, or, or, uh, or uh, argue today is that what we need to do is break power and hierarchy and, and really go out there and challenge it. And we'll never do great scientific research unless we have communities like that. Communities where curiosities are encouraged and where we don't say, no, no, that's not how it works. But on the contrary, encourage curiosity. I'm in despair sometimes about the science that I see my children and my, gra or my, children, my grandchildren now uh, do at school, where science is about, no, we'll tell you the answer. Science isn't like that at all. Science is about being curiosity poking problems, literally with a stick sometimes with little grandchildren, and to find out what happens. And we all know, if we're honest, that all our best science has done when we've been wrong, when we've done an experiment with, with, with a, a surprising result. And that's when we do great science. And the other reason why diversity in science is important, I think, is because people don't trust scientists. And, and, and we know that this comes with huge costs. Here we go. Uh, people, not, people being able to claim, the presidents of the United States even, being able to claim that, global, that human caused global warming is a fraud. Being able to fight against masks and, and being able to suggest that vaccines are there as some sort of conspiracy to grab you. We need scientists to be like everybody because then maybe people will trust the science because if we don't, this is what's going to happen to us in this world. So I, wouldn't, I, I hope I've explained to you why I think diversity in science is important. Not because it's fair, not because of all the other things, not because that's not true, but because science is important to the, to the future of the world. And unless we have not essential that we have diverse scientific community, an inclusive scientific community, to bring that talent to solving these problems. And I have been at more of these, these sorts of meetings than I can care to imagine. And one of the things I want to address today is why we're not seeing change. Why change is just so hard. 
I, of course, I'm coming at this from my experience of a woman in science, a woman in physical science. Um, and that's where I've spent most of my time working. Um, but I think that the lessons that I've learned from here are important and increasingly I've become aware to be important um, for the question of diversity of all kinds. Now, my friends, those of you who are my friends, and it's lovely to see so many of you here today, I've looked at you in, this, in the participant screen, uh, are used to me being cross about this. And, um, uh, and I do get really cross. Um, but, and people say, but Jane, it's getting better. It's getting better, look. You know, well, Nobel Prize, Prize winners to, in chemistry, two, two women winning the Nobel Prize for chemistry here. The president of the Royal Society and a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner um, is um, a, a, a scientist of colour. And not only that, you know, we, we can actually have scientists with dreadlocks um, be professors at, at, at Caltech. Everything's getting better. Just, just leave it, Jane. Just, just settle. It will work. And, and in some ways, things are superficially getting better. When I gave, when I'd given this talk before, I, I googled what the scientists look like. And a couple of years ago, when you went to Google and Googled scientists, this is what scientists look like. Mostly mad old men. Um, but of course, the woman scientist here playing with colour, because that's what girls do. Uh, and, and, and notice that... that, that, that um, uh, the, the scientist of colour here is a cartoon character, maybe because they couldn't find any photos. Um, well, if you look up scientists today on Google, actually it's changed and COVID has made a difference. And I think one of the things we could talk about later is what COVID has done to this question of diversity in science, because I think it's very worrying. But at least now um, these scientists are young, there's lots of females and there are some scientists of colour when you Google scientists. So maybe there is a change, but I think this is just window dressing. I think progress that in diversity in science is on a glacial time scale. Uh, it's very hard to find data on um, diversity, particularly in the UK, on, on, on diversity in the case of ethnic minorities, um, of people with disability uh, in there. But, but the Royal Society of Chemistry has done an awful lot of work on this. Um, and their conclusions are that not only is the current retention of women within chemistry poor, but it has been the case for many years. And this graph is really important. This graph says women do chemistry at undergraduate level. Even though I decry the fact that my seven-year-old granddaughter says that maths is hard and that's why it's for boys. Forgive me, but it makes me want to spit nails. Uh, but still, schools, high schools do a pretty good job of sending undergraduate schools, undergraduates, to, female undergraduates to, to, to do physical sciences. But look at the drop off here, down to at currently 9% of professors of chemistry in the UK are female. And they note in this report, it's important to note it doesn't account for further interaction between different forms of discrimination and disadvantage and that more research and data are needed to, to understand this. But this case has been true for years. And you know what? There has been virtually no change since I started. So there must be, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a sort of, I'm, I'm a sort of well, well, why? Well, why? Whose fault is it? And I can only see three possible answers for this. The first thing is that there's something unalterable about the nature of science or academia that means that men are just better at it. Maybe that's true. Um, and this, uh, this Italian professor um, came into serious trouble a couple of years ago, um, was actually fired from CERN because he actually dismissed those who argue um, that the domination of physics by men is, is discrimination. In fact, calls people like me a cultural mask Nazist. Uh, and in one of his things, he said, physics was invented and built by men. I absolutely refuse to accept that. I refuse with every bone in my body. His data that he was using was flawed because what he was saying is, well, look, men are publishing the papers, that, that, that must be men are better at it. But, but nonetheless, um, 
I don't think he's the only person that thinks this. My, my granddaughter already thinks this and she's seven. She didn't learn it from me and she didn't learn it from a scientist mother. So where did she learn that from? Now, could it be that there's a problem with women? Now, obviously, I mean, you, you'll all remember this case in 2015 when Tim Hunt, the Nobel Prize winner, said, well, the trouble with girls is you fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticise them, they cry. He was arguing that women aren't, aren't, aren't suitable for, for the rough and ready um, atmosphere of science, the rough and tumble, the toughness that you need to be a good scientist. Well, uh, uh, the women in, sci the, in, in the international scientist community uh, treated this with the contempt it, it deserved uh, and put one very large finger up to that notion. But in the Royal Society of Chemistry survey again in 2018, one of the survey respondents, a, a chemist in industry, said this, Women choose to have families, a very significant responsibility, and not compatible with a competitive career as a professional chemist. Women face zero discrimination. I'm sorry I'm reading it to you, and I know that you can read it, but it has to be read to be believed. Women chemists are encouraged at every opportunity. I hope you're all gobsmacked at that. You know, last time I, I, I saw, men often chose to have families as well. But this is the women should argument, and you'll all have heard this. Women should put themselves forward for promotion earlier. Women should be more ambitious when they're applying for jobs. Women um, should be encouraging young women, other women more, more, more actively. Do you know what women are doing? They're sitting on committees. Look at the Protein Society. 70% of the executive committee are female. We just saw that today. That's brilliant. Women stepping up to the plate. But would you know what, what? You know what the men are doing while we're on all those committees? They're back in the lab doing research. Just like in the lockdown, the women have been at home looking after their kids and the men have been writing grants and submitting more papers than women. So I would argue very strongly that the first two of these don't add up. So therefore I have to argue that it's the system. I, I, I've talked about this before, those of you who have heard me talk before, I would encourage you all uh, to read this article. It's about a, a young woman, an organic chemist who stepped out. She said, uh, uh, she lent out, she left a, a career in STEM. And in this thing, she says, when a pipeline leaks, we don't blame the water, we fix the pipe and we design the next one to leak less. Why do we blame women who leave STEM fields? Why do we say women should be more robust? Women should. And what she challenges us to do is quite clear. We should be welcoming diversity in it instead of paying lip service to it. We should be saying to people, this is why we need to be born more diverse, because the science is better for it, not because society will be better for it. We should be saying, we should be making the, the, the climate where people work, we should be making our departments much more, much more inclusive, much more rewarding for people who don't fit. We should be making sure that we're not, we're not throwing away the talent of these young people who want to be scientists, and yet we're, we're, not, we're not enabling that. We can make sure they face only the same pressures and frustrations as the straight, male, fully abled, white co-workers. And if she's that much like me, she'll love her work, she'll want to change, and we can support her. So I want to argue today that there's no shortage of water. Able, talented, curious, hardworking, clever young people of all shapes, sizes, all races, all abilities, I'm talking about you know, disabled students out there who are interested in science and able to contribute and make a difference. If we want to make a change, we have to pitch the pipe. That's to change the system, the whole system of science, to allow these young people to thrive within it and not force them out. 
So what have we got to do to change the system? First and foremost, I think we've got to accept the need to a change and commit to being part of the solution. And we need to articulate that need to change very clearly. And I think the way to do it is in terms of what science we can do and the importance of science to change the world around us for the better. By all means, we must be giving the sort of personal support and mentoring to those who are coming into and up the pipeline. I have benefited from this, as so many of you, and I try to mentor those around me. But we've got to be careful with this one because this is called the old boys network. We don't want to have a new old girls network or something like that. And we also must act to work on the hostile environment we ask people to work in. Have you done a survey of your department? In 2014, I did a survey of the chemistry department in Cambridge. These are things that were said. Every female member of my group has been physically in tears in the laboratory, most of them on a number of occasions. I've got female friends with promising careers who've decided to leave after a postdoc because they don't feel they'll be able to progress and have a family. Most of the female friends, you know, most female students I know have been struggled with lack of confidence and self-esteem. This is the macho um, organic chemistry view that some of you will know. You know, no excuse, otherwise an illness and emergency for not being there in those times. But we also need to make specific measures to change how science is done and who is funding it and who is doing it. We've got to be prepared to accept quotas for posts and for students. We've got to devise new measures of what success looks like and support, enforce those measures. I don't know any head of a department who won't choose who they think is the best member of, for, the, for that faculty position. But the trouble is they're deluded. They're defining success by what they are. I'm successful. Success must look like me. We've got to go out and challenge those measures of success and we've got to enforce those measures. We've got to prepare to offer specific funds and programs to support under underrepresented groups. And we've got to refuse to go where minorities aren't visible, refuse to talk in a conference if there aren't, if there aren't underrepresented scientists talking at those conferences as well. We've got to accept therefore that in our, and this is something that we've talked about and I've found very hard. I've, I've always been proud of the fact that my grandfathers were coal miners, that my dad left school at 15. And I've put my success down to being brought up by a family who believed in the power of education, by having a mother who always taught me never to, to never to let anybody to say no to me. And through my hard work and through the support of people that have mentored. But what I haven't thought of, and I think this year, and, uh, and, and the things that Bill talked at the beginning have what made me realize that I have also been extraordinarily privileged to be a, a white, wealthy, well, middle class. My parents were middle class, they weren't rich, but I never wanted for anything. Um, I never wanted for that support in my education. I never wanted for that drive through thy schooling. I, I didn't suffer from a disability. I didn't suffer from the, from, from, from the disability of, of race in any way. And that is hard. It's really hard. And I have to accept that if I want to push for this, then I have to give up that privilege, not just for myself, but for my children and actually for my students. And that is a difficult thing for us to be prepared to do. I think we've got to ask questions about the way we do research and whether that's explicitly disadvantage, disadvantage others who come from a different place or a different viewpoint. What do we value in our students? Who do we praise? Who do we not praise? And, and why are we doing that? And we need to wonder whether our research reflects the interests of the privileged. Just look what's happening in vaccines at the moment. Our governments are scrabbling over themselves to ensure that the elderly white people like me get the vaccines first. So I want to argue today more philosophically than what you've heard before that our future 
depends on us fixing the pipe, not just messing with the water. And this is going to take determination, courage and political will. We need to change the balance of power within science and with academia as a whole if we're really going to make a difference and if in 10 years time we're not going to be holding this same this same symposium again and let me tell you why 10 years is important in 10 years time my granddaughter will be going to going to university i want her to go to a better place than i'm ashamed that, that we have now thank you thank you jane that was uh a great call to arms and uh, a sobering uh, perspective that I hope uh, that we all take to heart. Okay, so um, so thank you. Those are really inspiring, and obviously we've gone a little long. Um, our goal um, is to uh, uh, answer as many questions as possible. Those of us who can stay on will continue to answer questions until we wrap up, even though we're only scheduled to go for two hours, um, and some people may have to leave. And um, we will continue to answer questions. So let's uh, transition to that stage now and allow those questions to be answered. So thank you to the panel. I have the first question that is from Serena uh, from Segan. These are the pre-webinar uh, questions. Um, so our first question is going to be directed to uh, Leroy Jones. Uh, and the question is, what are some good organizations that can help young underprivileged teens slash adults from middle school, high school, and in undergrad programs so they can network with experienced scientists for guidance on how to become a scientist in a specific field? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Um, I, I guess, you know, it really depends on, you know, the area that you're in. So I could think of plenty of places in Chicago that I have built um, relationships, you know, with. But of course, you know, that, you know, they can be pretty, re pretty regional. So what I would suggest that you do, a good starting place is simply looking, you know, at some of these funding agencies and just typing your question in there. And you can actually see, you know, who's doing what, who's they're partnering with. And, you know, just starting, you know, have, and then you can have that conversation, you know, with, um, with various people. So if, for example, in, um, in Chicago, you know, one of the one of the um, one of the things that come to mind, you know, is a, a program called Project Sincere. You know, so they deal with K through 12. Uh, they mentor those students through the process. Uh, they also, you know, um, 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 help them network uh, with professionals in the area as well as in the academy, um, just to bring about you know awareness. Another program that we have in the Chicago area is called um, is uh, After School Matters, and it's a simpler it's a similar type type of program. So I really think, you know, that that's just kind of regional and um, you would just need to kind of reach out, you know, the people in your area to, um, to figure out, you know, what organization exists, you know, that can, um, that can um, set up those type of relationships, you know, for your students. Great, thanks. I could just okay. add to that, that in Baltimore, there's a program called Baltimore Youth Works and every summer we have about a dozen uh, high school kids working in the lab. Uh, you know, funded by the mayor of Baltimore's office. And then they, the question also addressed undergraduates. And so, you know, the, the big ones are Nobuche, Abercan, Sackness. Those are great meetings that students can go to and become empowered. Great. Thanks, Mike. The second question is from Flora Mayer at NCSU. And this goes to Jane or other panelists. What initiatives should research institutions prioritize to avoid diversity fatigue while not stalling progress? Well, it's a terrible question to ask me when I'm in the middle of COVID and that everything is depressing me. Um, so, um, I think it's, I think it's being brave. I, I think you know, in some of the things which I have found most rewarding, possibly, uh, I, I don't know if rewarding is what we want, um, but yes, I suppose rewarding is what we want. If, you, if it's working hard, but you achieve something, you, you want to move on. I, uh, and so I think there are initiatives that, um, uh, for instance, in, in 
by doing that survey that, that I did at the chemistry department, people were completely shocked. But by shocking people, they, they were then prepared to put money behind training young, uh, training group leaders to, uh, in, in all kinds of um, how to manage a diverse team, how to look after your team. I think you want to think who can have the most, the most effect. And I think it is the research group leaders who can have the most influence. And it's the way they manage their team. It's about the way they reward science. It's about the way they research their team. Because I think that for everybody, wherever you are, if you work in a toxic environment, it won't bring out your best science and it will make you want to leave. So perhaps I think the most important thing to me, looking at that drop off in the research pipeline is to work on work with research group leaders and give them training and then um, continual support to improve their skills. There you go. I thought of something. Liz. That's thank you. And I actually want to just add um, to that because I do think this came up through a, a lot of the talks that we heard is that infrastructure is key. And so, you know, while this momentum is built as a time for our institutions to build the infrastructure and, pro and provide for this assumption that, that that fatigue is going to come. But if we've put the work in to build the infrastructure, um, then we'll have sustainability um, longitudinally. And that really should be the goal is to be thinking from that perspective. All right, I'll ask the next question. I would also really like to thank the panelists for a really stimulating and, and uh, great session. Thank you very much. Uh, the third question is going uh, to Carla to start with, and it's from David De Sancho from the University of Basque Country. And he asks, how do you reconcile our desire for equity or, or equality and fairness on the assessment of merit um, to allocate scarce resources? How do we do that balance, I think, is the question. Yeah, I, I think this goes back to that um, a point that I made that, you know, equity and inclusion is really part of, has to be part of everything we do, including um, recognition of work in this area for tenure promotion. Is this what you're asking? Is this, is this the gist of the question? I want to make sure I understood. Um, well, I'll, I just read the question as it exists. I don't know exactly what David had in mind. I can't, right. in his right. But, but I, think, I think that, you know, resources are, are short and it really is a matter of how important is it? Is it so important that we are willing to prioritize our resources to make this happen? You know, this is, this, like, like I said, it takes time, it takes money, and it doesn't just happen. So it's up to each institution to ask itself, how serious am I about this? How serious are we about this? Because if we're serious, the resources, even scarce resources, need to be, um, sh sh you know, put in that direction. And, and, and I think in a way that it pervades this priority pervades through all aspects of what we do it's not just something that goes on the side you know it's really got to be part of you know accountability and in every every aspect of, of merit and and you know i, I think that's how we're going to change it it's not going to be easy it's going to take time and money and, and I want to go back to the, the, the course release aspect of, of, of time. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, I think, I think, I know David, and, and I think one of the things that's always the problem is the idea that, I mean, this delusion that we have, that we can pick the best from the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we can pick, we can, we can certainly, we can certainly separate out the not so good but the delusion that we have that we can pick the best. So when we're doing hiring and things, we always think we're picking the best, but I think that, that we're deluded. And therefore, if we think diversity and inclusion is important, 
that's when we can actually give hirings to, to underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. I, would like to, I would like to add to that as well, that I think I'm um, just kind of building on Jane's point. One of the things that we have to recognize is that we all have biases. And you know, we have to try to figure out what those biases are so that we are fair you know, in the hiring process or in grantsmanship and the other, other areas. But a lot of times you have people who you know, don't think those biases exist. And that's, that's a big part of the problem. Yeah. One of, what, to speak to that, one of the things that we, we are doing in, in, as I'm chair of admissions is we are um, not giving as much weight to GREs and you know, GPAs. We look at research experience. We look at what the, you know, like the personal statement. We look at the letters of recommendations with care because letters of recommendations have their own biases and they're very, very real. Um, but to be aware of all of those things. Uh, so that you don't end up with the same old, same old, um, based on what the, de the this definition of what makes a person really the best. Freeman often talks about the um, genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you know, I can do this or that, then you're you're limiting what you can do. And I, the other thing that I would say is when it comes to resources, I don't know of a single research university in the country that also has undergrads that doesn't give out a lot of scholarship money. I mean, they, we do. And so the question is, couldn't you structure that scholarship of money around a subject like um, social equity, social justice? And you could do, that's what the Meyerhoff program is. And then if you look at UNC and Penn State, it's not like they magically came up with, you know, a million dollars a year, they restructured the things that they're doing. And so it, those are d hard decisions to make but you, it, it can be done with resources that you already have. So I have a, a general question um, that can be answered by anyone on the panel. This is from Catherine uh, from ASBNB. Um, what are some best practices for or examples of a truly inclusive, not just a diverse environment? Yeah, I, I, I can speak a little bit to, to that, you know, I think relation, building the relationships, listening, um, and, and really trying to educate ourselves about the different cultures and backgrounds of our different students, you know, of, of, and I think this is where it, it just takes you know, commitment with, you know, building, building trust, getting to know the students, listening, and actually um, making changes based on what the students are saying. You know, like, I, you know, I, ha I have an example uh, in one of our conversations, you know, we have, we have a, the, the, the students a long time ago put, put together a survival guide for new graduate students. And as we're having a conversation, some of, one of our minority students says, you know, there isn't a single thing um, in, in this guide that really talks about, you know, connections to, to minority groups or, you know, or support or, or things like that. And, and I said, well, you're right. How about, you know, you know, you, you put a group together and actually add to our survival guide so that we can, you know, to, to reflect those needs, you know, so I think, I think one of the major things is to listen, not to be dismissive, because it's, you know, one of the things that you read in a lot of, you know, like, of books that I've been reading for a long time now is, you know, it's very easy for us to dismiss or excuse um, certain behaviors. So dismiss uh, points of views of, of people of color because you, you can't really identify with, with them. So you know, they're, they're just being whiny or you know, sensitive or things like that. Um, and at the same time, um, we, you know, it's very easy to identify. It's, there's, there's no easier person to mentor than a person that is just like you with your, different, with your same background. Right. So the challenge is to be able to step out of that frame 
your own frame, your own experience, and listen. Listen and take it seriously. Take what other people are saying, what people of color, minority students are saying. Take it seriously because, you know, that's going to translate into being able to solve a lot of the problems that, that we have. So, you know, while training workshops and all sorts of things that we tend to do, these formal trainings are, I think, valuable and it gives us um, kind of new perspectives and, and um, ways to perhaps be sensitive. It's really about the personal relationships and listening to the students and taking them seriously. That was a long-winded response, but I think, I think I cannot stress how important that part is to really give value and listen to what students are saying when you can get them, when you can get students to talk in the first place, which is a challenge. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just saying, but that's very kind of parochial and local. And they, I mean, I, I think we need to be far broader in this, in this, mm -hmm. in, in this thinking about, about what we do. And, and I think the role that, that sort of heads of institutions can play, uh, that, that communities like the protein science community can play is so important. We've not mentioned that. Mm -hmm. yes. But many of my many of my most supportive people are from across the world who have only met through learning societies and i think the way that the protein society is is putting this on and it's working through that is something that we all as a community could do and your stuff is great we all want to do it we would all say we did it i bet everybody here would say yeah i do that but it's not solving the the international problem of lack of diversity. So I would, yeah. I would. I, I agree. I think we need to work at all of these levels. You know, it's not either or, like Mike Summer said, I think it's all of this. You know, all of these different yeah, leaders need to happen and they're really important. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, thank you. Um, so I am gonna ask a very local question because, um, you know, this is something certainly that I and I suspect many of us who are uh, running laboratories uh, or basically working with people right now during COVID are thinking about, uh, and this I'm going to direct first to, to Bill, I think, to address. Uh, what are some of the special challenges for DEI efforts during COVID? And how can you know, we as PIs support students uh, in our laboratories during this time? Are, are, are there things which you know, there are best practices that you've thought about that you're, you're taking on. And I know you're working very closely on DEI efforts at Caltech at the university level now as well, so. Uh, yeah, so I think there's not clear, easy answers to these kinds of questions. I mean, I think this is the craziest year, again, of, of my career. And I can only um, you know, mourn some of the suffering that our students are going through, thinking about all the things they're not getting that I got. Um, you know, during my process, you know, no graduations, no, you know, senior theses. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that are really kind of just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's awful. And I think in DEI, you know, compounds all of this right now, especially in sort of the, this this moment that that we're in. So how do you how do you support the students? Um, I think you know one thing is to just lead by example and let your students know that these are issues you care about, that you're concerned about, that you're active in, and that you're you're you support their activity in this area. Um, give students the space to be engaged and involved. Um, I think you know we need to figure this out as academics um, and certainly as administrators um, how to provide space for our faculty to do this. But I think as faculty members, we can already directly provide space for our students. Um, to do this um, uh, as part of their you know, responsibility as students. Um, and, uh, and that means you know, acknowledging that your students may want to do some outreach or they may want to uh, get involved in some campus committees that's gonna take away from their time in the lab. And so providing tools and space for them to be able to do that. And then I'd say the, the other thing um, is just to you know, talk about it. You know, this is one of the things I think that's kind of been impressive to me um, amongst my colleagues is just you know starting group meeting with 
uh, a discussion about, you know, okay, you know, any, any topics on diversity, equity, inclusion people would like to talk about this week, um, you know, things people like to make us aware of. Um, and, uh, and, and making that something that's part of our conversation that's just as important as things like safety and research and other things, you know, DEI is part of that in that conversation. And so I'd say that that I think is something that can really be, everybody can do. And, uh, and even for the, the students, um, I, I think you were listening, I think, you know, projecting that upwards too and letting your, your faculty member who may not be completely on board with it just say, you know, hey, I think this is an important topic for, for our group to be discussing. And then, uh, and, and hopefully that can, can start some conversations. You know, I mean, I do think, um, and Carla mentioned this, you know, you know having um, discussion groups, you know, at the division level, providing space for people to, to either come together as affinity groups or even just people who are interested in being engaged to discuss these issues is really helpful too. And so I think that's something people can think about as well. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Noel. This goes to Leroy initially. So uh, the question is what policies should be taken to uplift diversity, equity, and inclusion? And could incentives uh, improve DEI initiatives? Mm, very, very good question. Um, I think in terms of, of policies, there needs to be uh, something in place that creates an environment where all voices, you know, are, are heard. You know, we have to be open to what people are saying, you know, in order, you know, so that they can, they, so they can understand that we really value, uh, you know, them as them as individuals. Um, I remember, you know, at Chicago State when I was coming up through the ranks and I was a little concerned, even in my department, um, that we were not hiring people that looked like me. And I remember talking uh, with my father about it. And uh, he says, well, Leroy, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. And he essentially said, you know, the days of, you know, marching outside of a door or marching in the streets, you know, saying we shall overcome is over. So if you really want to change policy, you need to try to get yourself in a position where you can be at the table and help making those type, type of decisions. So when we talk about inclusiveness, I, I think you know it has to be some 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 uh, some mechanisms in place, you know where you know policies where we encourage you know more people that's more reflective of our society, you know that can really provide input, you know how we can get to this place, you know of DEI. Um, I'm I'm at a crossroads about incentives, and the reason why I'm at a crossroad about incentives, I I think that people should naturally, you know, want to do that and not be in, incentivized. But at the same time, you know, especially being in the academy and, you know, where professors, you know, have to balance this thing of teaching, research, and service, you know, sometimes some things can get lost. So you do need to get credit for that or be incentivized, you know, in order to make those things happen, um, not only at the university, but also in the, um, in the workplace. Um, so even, you know, even with that, I think, you know, we need to, you know, just have a conversation. And, you know, it's, and I think it'll be very local, you know, to the organization that you're in, the institution that, you, that you're in, just to try to determine, you know, what people, you know, value and what will motivate them, you know, to really, um, to really invest in, invest their time, you know, to this whole ideal, you know, of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Yeah, and, and I think another point about that is, is that, as institutions start to recognize and validate um, this kind of work, other faculty, I mean, will look at that and, and, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll see that if they have an inclination to work in that area, that's a good thing and that they, that will get them recognition, right? It's valued. So one of, so, so part of the, you know, the the disincentive in the in the in the past and even now in in most places I would say is um, you know you're doing it out with no recognition or incentive and that you know in a place where you're we all know you know we're pretty much pressured to to keep going to get the the grants to get the research going at least in in R one institutions and in many other institutions and without that recognition and, and I, I kudos to the nsf for putting such a big um emphasis on you know the broader impacts 
I think that made a lot of change. And it's through the, you know, the very real support, financial support and recognition that people are, will be naturally incentivized, um, you know, especially those who already feel like they want to do something in those areas, but had just had felt like they, they just don't have the time and resources. We also at Waterloo changed our practices of performance evaluation to increase service mm -hmm. and made it real. And yeah, exactly. That kind there of can be policy changes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask our leadership here, uh, Bill and Amy, we're, we're at our time. I, I'm certainly willing to go on and continue asking questions that we've got from the audience and so forth, but I, I don't want to abuse our panelists who've already given of their time. So I will ask you guys to make a decision about whether we're going to keep on going and ask questions and continue to ask questions or whether we should uh, thank everybody for their efforts and call it quits now for the moment. Um, well, I think um, at this point, I, I do want to thank the panelists and, you know, for, for being here and appreciating, um, you know, all the good work that they're doing um, and just want to acknowledge that and just, you know, say how impressed I am uh, just by, uh, by, by, by having colleagues like you. It's just inspiring to me every day. Um, I think, uh, uh, so I'll say that before, we, before people start to, to, to drop off. Um, we do have more questions to answer. So I think if people are willing need to go, they should feel free to leave. Um, but we can answer these questions and continue the recording, um, at least for maybe another 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and, and, uh, and the questions, if they're not answered to those who are still online waiting for questions, if we don't answer them, we will try to answer them in the chat. And we will then um, uh, post those uh, along with the, uh, the, the, uh, the talks as well, or the whole entire session. And so that that will look for that um, notification in your email. Okay. Well, then I will follow up then with the question, which um, I, I think I'm going to address to um, uh, Mike, and that is, uh, you know, in the context of all of the wonderful efforts you've done in terms of integrating URM students, both at the graduate level and at the undergraduate level, could you say a little bit about what particular um, efforts uh, go into supporting first year graduate students when they're coming into graduate school. Um, I, I think probably the same thing could be true for, for undergraduates as they're entering. Um, yeah. yeah, sure, thank you. Um, it's actually quite a bit different at the two levels. So at the undergraduate level, there's a lot, it's a much, much more intrusive effort. It's about uh, building a cohort that is very supportive. And um, just to give you a sense of how that works, the, uh, this, the cohort and the size is usually about 60 or 70 students. Um, they have to take a, a calculus class and it's a pretty rigorous course. The students are instructed to uh, group off into groups of four and they, they're told, taught how to study in groups. Now they take their first quiz, but then the group gets the um, average grade of a group. Well, it's even better because the whole class gets the grade of the weakest group. So, and these go on their transcripts. And so after the first quiz, the students are allowed to, to reorganize. And if you've ever taught and you've ever asked students to work in groups, you know what usually happens is the well-prepared students get together and the weaker students are, are left floundering. Now, because everybody's grade is, is at stake, the, the well-prepared students look for who to help. So that's one example of the really intrusive way we try to build community. We also put the students under a lot of stress so that, and give them the tools to learn how to deal with that stress so that when they're in their classes in the fall, when they have multiple exams and all, everything is crashing down, they, they, they have the, the ability and confidence to deal with all that. So at the undergraduate level, it's a very intrusive um, support system. At the graduate level, many of the students have families, some have children, um, and so we don't have that kind of a structure. But we do have the incoming graduate students get together um, once with all of the students once a, once a month. 
the students give talks uh, within this group. You know, it started as a small group, and now we have over 100 students. So it's very empowering. To, there, there really is strength in numbers. My role has become quite diminished uh, since the early days when I really knew people well and was involved in their lives. Um, so it, they're, they're, it's quite a bit different, but it's mainly uh, integrating them. They can learn from the more senior people what faculty to avoid. Uh, they learn from, from the staff or the program, which faculty are the ones that are likely to be the most supportive. And if they do get into trouble or they think they're in trouble, they know who they can come and talk to. You know, they may feel like decisions are being made based on race and we can say, you're having a tough day. Think about it, let's talk about it tomorrow. Or they can come in and say something that happened say, oh my God, I've got to intervene. And so making sure that they had, even the graduate students with families need a place where they can go and, um, and feel comfortable communicating. And so there, there really are two different programs. Mike, uh, um, what about faculty? Do you have faculty training programs? Um, I want to acknowledge Mary Jo Andrikan, who's one of the co-PI on the Howard Hughes um, and is doing a magnificent uh, job uh, helping to organize and run these these faculty training programs, and I just wanted to hear uh, what you're doing there um, to make, you know, ha has that been effective, and how 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 do you see that? So, Carla, I'm really glad you asked. If you look at Freeman's recent paper in PNAS, he basically brags about the fact that UMBC does not have a chief diversity officer. And he buys in with that this is all of our responsibility. And if you hire somebody and say, you train them, you teach them, you make sure the university is doing what it's supposed to do, then you're, you're really abrogating your, your responsibility. And, and, by, and so that's the first thing. The second thing is in my history at UMBC, we've never had diversity training. We've never had formal diversity training. We did have a very effective training program with our advanced program. And so I have seen that kind of diversity training work really well, where you bring in actors and they put on skits and you listen and then you learn from those kinds of activities. Um, but in, in terms of ethnic minority diversity, no, this has really been something that, you know, the, we will walk into a classroom of 300 people we saw 20 black kids in the front row, shoulder to shoulder, 10 minutes before class. We started having a conversation with those students. And within days, your mindset changes. Yeah. You want to be part of it. it, it it's, a, it's a completely different approach from what much of the country is. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not downplaying diversity training. I'm saying it wasn't a part of our approach. And if you're going to do it, you have to be really careful because you don't want to. I mean, the sad truth is that the people in power and academics are still white males. And so you you need them to want to be part of this effort. And so you need to take an approach. Freeman figured it out. Yeah. Well, and this is done through, convert, at least at Northeastern, for, as far as I know, this is done through sustained conversation. It's not like you go to a training session. Right. Uh, it's, it's really through long-term repeated groups that that through discussion and conversation um, which i think you know i i do think it's a more effective way than um having somebody go there and train for an hour and then you go back and do the same thing you've always done basically right and you know as part of our work together with pdep is we want to give new mentors of postdocs uh, yes. like uh, whistling vivaldi you know one of my right, right. blanton tolbert who is here is a faculty member at Case now. He gave yeah. me that book, and it was, you know, just things like that to stimulate discussion. There are positive great book. ones. I've read it too. It's really. I, I would recommend that to all of you who are listening. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question. Um, actually, two questions that are somewhat similar. So the first question is from Vishwa Trivedi, um, and it's how could T S TPS provide outreach and promote it amongst HBCUs. And then the second question is from Catherine Royer. Um, do you have any ideas as to what scientific societies can do to increase inclusion and diversity in STEM? Um, so I'm gonna direct those questions to um, Bill and or Amy, but anyone 
can jump in. Um, okay, so uh, so in terms of the, t the protein society and, and what we can do to do outreach to minority serving institutions on HBCUs, perhaps um, more explicitly, um, we are working through that now ourselves, trying to get a, 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 our heads around how we can best do that. I think um, you know we're we're very fortunate to have uh, friends like Leroy who are willing to at least talk to us and give us some perspective. But I do think that's what it's going to take is to is to um, have these conversations. Um, in a non-intrusive and partnering way, and so we're we're um, being careful to to consider that as we uh, as we move forward. Um, I do think um, you know it's critical for us as a society to to do um, you know more outreach to bring you know you know a, a more diverse membership, and uh, and I think that's what's always drawn me to the protein society is that it's just how diverse it feels like when you go to the protein society meetings even if it's not necessarily reflected in our speaker numbers it's certainly reflected in the pool of people that we have who are attending and uh, and so that's uh, something that i think we really um need to continue to to be excited about and to support um and uh, and so the and so the protein society will be making efforts and we welcome any suggestions or um or desire to uh, engage at that level from from our membership um to be involved in it and then uh and then i think the uh the I guess I don't remember the full context of the second half of the question. Uh, Kathy asked what societies can do, which I think you're yes, wrong. Doing, so yeah. yeah, and you know it's interesting. I just sorry, I mean I'll no, let no, you no, go no. in a second. But I just will say, you know, in in taking on this role, I've had a lot of conversations with with you know science colleagues and other leadership roles in other societies who have also been struggling with these kinds of questions. In fact, I'm talking at a similar panel um, at the, uh, uh, at the um, Biophysics Society coming up, um, because I think we're all kind of grappling with this conceptually about what we're supposed to be doing and how do we, you know, we have this desire, now how do we implement it? And there's no question, I think, that, uh, that we've heard a lot of really useful information today. And so I think we all can be activists in this area, but from societies, you know, societies, um, uh, you know, are gatekeepers to some extent. And so putting the work in to, you know, nominate for awards, people who, you know, don't necessarily fit a stereotype that, that we've been discussing, um, that's really critical to make sure we elevate people, to invite people to give talks, um, to do the work when we go to our meetings, to, um, to engage with people who, um, who are from the historically underrepresented um, areas and, um, and ensure that we invite those people to give talks, we encourage them to apply to jobs at our institutions. You know, we put that work in, and I think that's where the real power of a society can be, is that, that we do you know, create this community. And so I would encourage, you know, you know, all societies to sort of take this, take this on, but that, I think real ways we can do this. That, that's really terrific. I'll just add, I knew Bill would say <laughs> everything I could possibly say more, but um, Bill and I have had some discussions about you know, the, there are some core things that we do as the Protein Society, and one is to have our annual symposium, which includes giving awards. And we've been thinking a lot about how those core events can be platforms for doing things in DEI, bringing more people to the meeting, creating a sense of community at the meeting, removing financial barriers for a broad range of students to um, and postdocs to come to the meeting um, and then making sure that they feel welcome when they get there because I think we're all members of the society because we find it to be a really welcoming and stimulating community and I think we'd like to offer that to young scientists from a really broad range of um, places and backgrounds. So the DEI committee is thinking hard about the um, specific ways in which we can do this so stay tuned for more news from them. But I would also like to, to add to it, and uh, Bill and I have had some of these conversations. So what you'll find out is that these federally funded minority focused programs you know, have huge networks. So for example, with the LSM programs, about 60 alliances throughout the, uh, through the nation, which represents about 700 schools. And I would say in every state, they have some type of conference that they pull all of these students together statewide. So just having TPS go there and either give a presentation or have a table and talk about the opportunities within the society is a, is a great way, you know, to get the word out there and invite these students, you know, to the table and, and, and share with them, you know, what you, what you do. Great, thanks. 
this is perhaps a related question. I'm going to combine several that have been asked by uh, Kwaku Dai, Arun Agarwal, and Yun Sun Nam. And the questions really go to what have, um, let's start, it goes to actually many from the committee, but I'll direct it to um, Mike and Leroy and Carla. Well, any of you. Uh, so what have you learned from the students about why they have declined to engage in STEM and what do they most want? Well, I can what are their barriers? Sure. I can say at UMBC, I, the, um, from assessments that uh, Ken Matten has done, who's a psychology faculty member here, um, what we think is that um, in those big freshman uh, chemistry and you know the large entrance gateway courses, um, the, if the, the minority students uh, may maybe did poorly on their first quiz or test, um, there was a sense that they didn't belong. The you know imposter syndrome, and we would lose students that way. Uh, what we think is that um, by having these visible uh, students, not only in the classes but then ultimately in the tutorial center as tutors, um, that the first instinct isn't, I don't belong here. The first instinct becomes, what do I need to do to get help? So, and then there's a second part of it, which is the faculty have changed their approach to the students. We have lots of examples of faculty who expected um, an, an upper level chemistry student, if they earned a C or maybe they got a B, they were a really good student. And there would only be one or two in these upper level classes. As the numbers of students went up, we saw the Meyerhoff scholars in these upper level classes doing really well, setting the bar on the exams. Those faculty changed how they reached out to students. So a black student earns a C, they would call them into their office and say, um, I looked at your exam, why did you go this direction? So there were, there were a lot of things that changed, uh, it, but it was all about expectations, I think. I'm finished, thanks. Okay. I'd like to answer this from the perspective of the graduate students. You know, what do the graduate students really care about? And, you know, I, I have to say, the science, you know, they want to be seen as, you know, important contributors to the science in their groups, in their labs. And too often, you know, there are assumptions that are put upon students of color that maybe if something doesn't work out, an experiment doesn't work out, you know, for a white student, the response might be, oh, you know, everybody makes a mistake. This is, this is fine. You know, learn from your mistake and try this and this and this and this and this and let's talk about it. Very often, a student of color will be, um, judged as incompetent because of that mistake. And I can't tell you how often that happens. And we as mentors need to be aware of that and, you know, open up opportunities for learning and contribution and validation of, the, of, of ideas um, as we do for the mainstream white students. And that's a real thing, you know, I'm not just making this up. It, it's, it, it's kind of unbelievable when we put it into words like that, but it, it's, it's really something that we as mentor need to be sensitized to. And that goes back to, to, to what I was saying about not being dismissive, not, to, not being judgmental and reflect all of our biases onto that one incident. You know, so I'm talking about things that happen to any, anybody will be judged and act upon differently, whether it's a white student or a student of color. So students care about that, you know? So we can talk about, they care about being listened to and heard and, but you know, the students are there to do science and they wanna be able to do science at their best. And we need, it's our job to open the doors and facilitate that as mentors. So I've been to conferences where, you know, they spent several days talking about the barriers, you know, for minorities, first gen, 
females, you know, people with disabilities, um, to higher education. And I, I think that three that kind of float to the top, you know, thinking about Chicago State, mm -hmm. the first one would be just student preparedness. You know, so the students often come in and they're quite not where they need to be, you know, to take that chemistry course or the physics course or the calculus course. And this is where the faculty really plays a big role, you know, by affirming them and then just providing them with that extra support to try to get them, you know, over, you know, over the hump. So one is um, preparedness. The other one that's really not talked about a lot, especially, you know, at urban type schools, um, is this competition between survival or working and education. So a lot of these students come in and they need to work full-time, full-time jobs. So one of the things that we try to do, you know, in the, in the center that I'm over is provide these students with stipends and other resources um, so that they can spend more of their time at the university because we found that that's the best way, you know, of, um, of retaining them. And then the last thing, you know, with once again, you know, faculty plays a big role is just dealing with some of those external barriers. And, and that's really hovers around just providing uh, assistance to them, you know, as they're dealing with family support mm -hmm. issue. So right in their family, they're being told, why are you going to college? You know, you're never going to, you're never going to make it. You're never going to survive, you know, or, you know, you need to be working. And they really can't see the family that is you know, um, what will happen if this student, you know, goes to college. So I've seen students who, you know, who've come in and, you know, they were, they were very, you know, they're very rough around the edges, but it was just amazing as they went through the educational process, how they changed and what it did for them and changed their social status, but it only didn't change their social status and their mindset. It also impacted their children and their, you know, their family, you know, their family as well. So those are just three areas, you know, uh, of many, you know, that um, I've encountered, you know, as barriers for minorities in higher education. If I could just build on what Carla said, too, we've had Meyerhoff undergrads who have gone to really good places for graduate school, and the, 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 the graduate programs did what they thought was the right thing, which is to have set aside money to diversify the graduate pool so the students would get these fellowships and they could choose whatever lab they wanted to join. And we've had cases where they joined a lab who wouldn't want a free pair of hands, but then they weren't really given the high-end projects. It was like, we're gonna, we'll, we'll have this extra set of people, I'll do what I can, but the priority, seem, priority projects didn't seem to go to those students. So it's, it's just a case where people are trying to do the right thing, and in some cases it works, probably in most cases it works, but you have to be really careful about what can happen, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. So I, I didn't take the next question and I'll take the question from Shirley Jackson. Charlie, we're having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. I don't know if you nope. Can you hear me now? It's still the same. I don't know if your mic's farther away or covered by something perhaps. My uh, oh, there we go. That sounded better. Nope. You hear me? Now I'm, yeah. Yeah. Go now ahead. you can hear me okay? Yeah. Sorry. Okay about that. Yeah. I mean, we, we went past my limit for my, my ear, ear pod things. And so now I'm hooked up differently. So the question I have actually came from Sheila Jaswell from Amherst College. And I mean, it gets to a number of uh, issues that, that were bought, brought up about uh, sort of institutional commitments and so forth. And I'm going to pose this question first to Jane. And it really has to do with, you know, given the fact that all that much of the hard work, and Jane spoke to this in, in her presentation, uh, falls on, you know, women and people of color in terms of these DEI efforts, et cetera, at our institutions. What should we be doing or how can we move to recognize this in, you know, acknowledging it and, and, and moving forward those individuals in their promotions and so forth. And um, actually, so Jane, if you go ahead and address that, is it, if it's clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hi, Sheila. Um, I, 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 think, I think, again, it, it comes down to trying to get our institutions to reconsider what looks like excellence. So, 
you, know, it, you could be doing excellent research and be doing some work I I in this area. And what they need to judge is how excellent is your research, not how big and how tall and how high is your group. And I think that to, to, we need to keep banging at this um, idea of excellence. I, I mean, we've got to do, I mean, Liz talked about sort of, sort of rewarding stewardship. And I mean, in, in Cambridge, you, you have three ways. You've got to do teaching, you, you've got to do research, and you've got to do scholarship. And nominally they're equal, but in fact, you can get away and get promoted full professor and, 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 and keep getting promotions and more money so long as you do this. I mean, in fact, they're doing this actually to the institution because actually, you know, they're not doing the teaching very well. They're, they're doing it badly. And so, you know, people don't want them to teach and drop out their courses. Uh, their contribution to, to meetings is poor. They never prepare for the meetings, so people stop asking them to be on committees. But they're getting paper after paper after paper after paper, and they get promoted. Um, and, 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 and this is, okay, I'm in Cambridge. It's a, it's a, you know, it's known for its research. And until the rest of us stamp and complain, and it's only the other senior people who can make a difference to that. But until we've got, until we've got diverse people at the top who are committed to this, there will be no change. So it's getting the top changed. And that's what the McKinsey said. You need diverse people, in the executive to make the team at the bottom better. I, can I just say, I'm really sorry, it, I, it's, it's 7.30 and I've got another meeting here in the evening. Uh, so I'm going to have to go, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill, Amy, everybody for inviting me. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, and I'm really sorry to have to leave, um, but thank you for having thank me. great questions though. So thank you. All right. Bye. Anna. Thank you, Jane. That was really great. And I just, I want to um, add on to Jane's question and maybe we'll um, if I, let other people answer, but, but then we'll wrap up with that as our final question. Um, and one point that I wanted to make um, uh, myself, you know, as a, as a, you know, a, a underrepresented, historically underrepresented um, member of this community is, um, you know, for me, you know, my motivation to be involved in DEI work is something that I feel very deeply and obviously probably perhaps rooted in my family history and my own experience. Um, but it is something that I feel that I have to do, um, not because it's expected of me, but just something that motivates me and provides my spirit with some sense of sanity. And so I don't think for me, and this isn't true for everyone, and nor should it, as it should have to be, but for me, it's not a question of, do I want less work in this area? Because I'm doing this work because it's important to me. What I want is not to be penalized for this work. And the re and, and this is sort of what Jane was saying is that, you know, by the people who do this work, which is critical and essential to, to, to the success of the academy, um, in not being recognized for that work and instead only caring about publications and grant money as sort of the things that we hold up as our institutions as the things that we value. You know, what we end up with is that the people who ignore this important component get rewarded and by their getting rewarded that means that i'm not getting access to certain resources or certain things right and so what i don't necessarily want to do less work i, I just don't want to be punished for it and at the same time i also feel that if everybody else if we stop talking about this as extra work and started talking about this as just just work that's part of being an academic it's all of our responsibility, therefore we're all doing it, therefore it's not extra things that any of us are doing. And if we can get to that state, which you know, obviously we're a long way away from, but if we can get to that state where all of us are actively engaged in this and feel that it's important um, just as a part of our job as academics, um, not just academics actually, and um, um, across the board, I think in the sciences, um, if we're all contributing to it, then it's not work for any of us. It's just part of what we do, it's not extra work. And I think if we get to that state, um, it'll be a better state um, for all of us. And so I think, you know, you know, right now, the institutions need to value this work in a way that it's not valued right now. Um, we, and then as we move forward, we need to start penalizing our colleagues who aren't contributing to it. I mean, frankly, I mean, that seems to me to be the only answer is to say, you know, if you're not willing to do the, the service work, 
um, um, that makes this institution um, thrive and provides and creates the best possible outcomes for our trainees, which is why those of us in academia are in academia or should be, um, then, then we're not doing our job. Bill, I guess I would just follow up by saying that for me, I mean, I'm, a, I'm obviously at a place where the, where the administration cares about inclusion. And so I've, I've never felt like this was something that was, a, was, you know, something I had to fight to be able to do at UMBC. Now, with other organizations, I was told if I, at least many years ago, if I did these things, I might lose my, my support for my research. And so times have changed and things have gotten better. But for me personally, um, it doesn't feel like service because I, I can just remember it wasn't maybe 10 years ago, my grandmother passed away and I was sitting at my desk thinking, what would I do if I knew I wasn't going to be around tomorrow? And I had just published in a high profile journal and I thought, you know, I realized I wouldn't pick up that journal article and reread what we had just published. I'd probably read the letters that I'd gotten from former students and parents. And, you know, it kind of made me realize that uh, the impact that we have is, can be, not for everybody here, but for me anyway, so much bigger than, than the science. And I think that doing this for me has made my life much more rewarding than it would have been if, if I was just had for my career, you know, papers to show for it. So it, re it really is, I think, um, an opportunity that people have to do something that can, in a way, it's selfish. It makes you feel good. And um, so for people that are interested, you know, there's, um, it, it's, there are ways to make things happen, even if places that aren't UMBC. For me, it's made the science that much more interesting and exciting. You know, it really does make a difference in, you know, what you can get done in your, in your lab, in your group, the dynamics of the group, you know, the way people, you know, own what they, what, you know, kind of take ownership of being part of the team. Um, you know, it, it really, I think it's, it's, it's totally worth it. And it's worth it at so many different levels for so many different reasons. But I, I, I agree with Bill that this, this needs to be, um, you know, something that's recognized and the expectation be that everybody contributes to, in, in the, you know, in, a, in, in this way, takes diversity and inclusion and equity into account and are aware of the obstacles that are so often present for our students of color. And uh, that's, you know, that's why it's important, you know, that the people that's listening, you know, on this webinar, as well as the people that's on the panel, you know, that we continue to work, you know, in these areas to, in a sense, replicate ourselves. And, you know, by replicating ourselves, then we, we, we bring more people into the academy or to the institutions, you know, that shares, you know, our, our same passions. And hopefully, you know, it becomes part of the norm, you know, then and not being a part of the norm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, well, first off, uh, before I let Amy wrap us up, um, I just want to you know, personally thank uh, Leroy, Carla, Mike, and uh, Jane for taking this time to come and present to our society. Um, this is obviously a, a topic that's important to the leadership and the, the executive council and your willingness to, uh, to participate in this and, your, and the ins inspiration of your story. Um, of your very story is, is really, uh, uh, really was great to hear. And I just want to thank you personally for that. Again, um, we are going to post this entire session online and, uh, and provide that information. There will also be some resources available that um, speakers have provided that they wanted to share um, with uh, people who are here. So feel free to share that information with others who couldn't attend. And, uh, and we look forward to um, suggestions from the community about future um, uh, uh, webinars that we can do in this same area. I think this is really great. And thanks to you and Amy and the people in the society for, for doing it. It's yes, for sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Right. I didn't want to add anything other than heartfelt thanks to Bill and the rest of the DEI committee for putting this together and continuing to think about the things that we can do in this space. So thanks to you all. And I think that's a wrap. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. <laughs>